This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Uh, this is a meeting of the Amherst Town Council. It is January 25th, 2021. And seeing that we have a quorum of the council present, I am going to call the meeting to order at 633. Um, I am going to um, read the background and then I'm gonna be calling on people to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual town council meeting. I, call, I will call on each counselor by name, and at that time they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that they can hear us and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. So I'm going to begin, and uh, Shalini Balmelm. Present. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Hold on one second. Oh, please bring Darcy in from the attendees. Okay. And I'll come back and check with her. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. And Sarah Schwartz. Present. And Darcy Dumont is now in the room. Can you trust Darcy? I'm here. Thank you so much. So we I'm are okay. Uh, this meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. It is also being recorded. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have a technical issue, please make sure that Athena and I both know so that we can address it in the meeting, either make note that you were interrupted or help you get be reconnected. Um, Discussion may be suspended if we have a technical issue, and Athena will be monitoring uh, counselor connections along the way. Um, we're going to start with some announcements. They're shown on your screen. I'm not going to read them, but I do want to call attention specifically. Sean, are we ready with the announcements? Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to call attention specifically to the February 4th meeting of the school committee. This is a meeting with residents at their request. It's at 6 o'clock p.m. And all counselors are invited to attend it, although we are not, it is not one of our meetings. The link for the meeting will be able to be found on the school website, I'm told, as of tomorrow. Uh, I also then want to go to one other announcement, and that is actually going to be that we're, instead of doing a full COVID update, we've asked um, Emma Dragon as our Director of Health, give us a quick update on COVID vaccinations. And we will not have questions because frankly, this is an ever moving target. And the answer to that question today may change tomorrow or even tonight. So if we could now go on to the um, public service announcement that Eva, Emma is doing, and there's a slide presentation. Sean? Yeah, in just a moment.
is it my turn to go? Yeah. I, I wasn't quite Emma, sure if Emma, that was. I'm just pulling your slides up now. Oh, great. All right. It was like that moment of you silence. You want to fill the dead air? Yeah. Let's all do a mindful minute of breathing before. Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> hmm. So I know um, there's just, can everyone hear me all right? I'm not quite sure how my connection is here. Great. So there is just so much going on with public health and just like how Lynn said, um, the information is changing day to day and even hour to hour again. It's very reminiscent for me um, for being back in, in March and February in public health with how the speed of the information that we're getting all the time. Um, so here we have the first slide, which is just that we're going to do a special update with how COVID vaccine distribution is going in Massachusetts and how it's impacting us here locally in the town of Amherst. Next slide. So here we can see the phase distribution timeline in the state of Massachusetts. This is a really nice visual that's available at that mass.gov site about COVID vaccines, um, which can give you some overview on when we're going into those. And at the bottom of this infograph, it does give us some estimated timeframes for when we are in each phase, but certainly those timeframes are subject to adjustment based on uh, availability of the vaccine. Next slide. So right now we are full force in phase one group of distribution, which is including all of the individuals uh, and groups within phase one. It started with those COVID facing healthcare workers, then those long-term care facility resident and workers, first responders, which included EMS fire, police, and 911 dispatchers, congregate care settings, home-based healthcare workers, and then finally those non-COVID facing healthcare workers, meaning healthcare workers that aren't knowingly taking care of actively sick patients with COVID at that time. So these are all of the many different groups that we're addressing with a phase one distribution. Now, next slide, coming very soon, and just now is this great map on the state site where individuals, currently it's only for phase one individuals, but where you can use this interactive map on the state website to find a vaccination site near you. And they're trying to make it helpful with all these different colored stars to, so you can know what kind of site they are. Uh, but I know sometimes when we try to make things really specific, it can kind of look a little cluttered. But as you can see over here at, to the left of this picture of this map, you can see a, the green star over Amherst, which is the general vaccine site at UMass. And then you can start to see a little bit of yellow under there, and that's us, um, which is a local vaccination site, which is open to select cities and towns. And information um, for this map, it's currently only available for p individuals in phase one distribution, but they are gonna be expanding it to the other phases throughout the distribution. So residents will be able to see what vaccine sites are, are live. Um, or available at that time. And I put that link at the bottom of this slide to help us out. Next slide. So, so far we have done an amazing job uh, with vaccine distribution and the amount that we were allocated. We've been, we stood up a site at the Bang Center and we ran dates from January 11th to 15th and also another day on January 22nd, a total of 692 vaccines were distributed. All of the, um, the eligible phases, uh, individuals were those phase one individuals. And I just can't say enough how this has really been possible with a partnership of our fire departments, public safety, uh, us here in the health department as well. Um, not just locally, but interagency with the multiple towns around us and in Hampshire County. And that we had a great experience uh, 
having the COVID ambassadors come and assist to our clinics to help and do some education because this is just a, such a trying time. And I think I heard some, um, I know I've heard people say that, you know, why don't I just stop by the site to see if there's some extras or maybe at the end of the day. And some of it's education and some of it is just really great relationship building. Um, but those COVID ambassadors, my goodness, that's such a wonderful program. And our paramedics are vaccinating alongside our school nurses and our uh, lead public health nurse, uh, Jen Brown. And it's just a really amazing team that's come together during this time. Next slide. So vaccines moving forward, I know this is all everyone's big question. I mean, it's, it's my question too, as, as information kind of changes day to day. So right now we are administering the Moderna vaccine, which many people know, like the Pfizer vaccine, you need two doses to be able to be fully vaccinated on their schedule. And us as a town it is very prepared uh, to continue as a site for broader distribution. This might be at the bank center or at the high school. Um, we're considering the high school as another site as well. Our plan has a capacity to do up to 2,500 2, vaccines a week if we were to go to the high school. Uh, but certainly we can have all of these plans and energy and um, enthusiasm, but without the, the materials, without the supply, in the supply chain coming down to us, we're really limited to that. Uh, last night we were notified and some people might've seen in the news today or by Dr. Governor Baker's statement earlier today that there is a supply shortage to the state of Massachusetts at this time with vaccine distribution. And that right now local health departments are gonna be limited to an allocation of 100 vaccines a week through the end of February. We do want to also recognize that UMass as that general vaccine site is a regional site that's available to our residents. There are also plans of a mass, mass size vaccination site, which is being planned to start at the Eastfield Mall in the next week or so. So there's more sites coming online. They also want us to encourage our residents to further communicate with their primary care providers, or there's also going to be pharmacies that will be carrying the vaccine as well. So there's gonna be multiple different venues where people will be able to access the vaccine. But us on the public health side, we're ready to go if we're given the supply, because we wanna be there for our communities in need. Next slide. So frequently asked questions, I know, oh my goodness, Mary Beth and Jen Reynolds and her staff at the Council on Aging are getting questions all the time. And I know we are as well, in addition to the COVID concerns line, Angela Mills and Jen Wilson, they are just rock stars. So many of the questions that we get, here's just a few. Seniors over 65 of age are in phase two. Yes, you are. So the order for phase two distribution, um, is in order of who goes first as what they're listed of priority. That was the word I was looking for. for. So the first step in phase two is those individuals that will be 75 and older. And then it will go down to the seniors, the wise individuals uh, that are over 65 years of age or individuals that identify as having two or more co medical comorbidities. And then after that, the third step is all of the great infrastructural workers, those teachers, um, food workers, grocery stores, DPW, all of our inspectors and public health workers. Um, there's that huge group at the end of phase three, um, uh, at the end of phase two for that. Caretakers and translators, of course, they can accommodate those that are seeking the vaccine. We've already had that on occasion. Um, we are working on making sure that we will be able to provide notification education in multiple languages. Um, we're also working with, uh, I know Mary Beth has been communicating with many 
town groups so that way we can engage our different populations that speak multiple languages so that way we can meet them where they're at and see our communities in need. And the final thing here is that home health care workers are eligible for the vaccine at this time. That did just change last week as all of phase one is now open and we're happy to have them register. We already have had a lot of local home health care workers come to our vaccine site. And that's not just home health care workers that work under an agency or a company. Those could be in a, a, a family member that takes care of a elderly family member or a disabled family member. Um, those are also people that can identify as home health care workers. Next slide. How will I know when I can get the vaccine? So Mary Beth Ogilevitz made this great number, this 413-259-3038 number. It, it's a specific line that's a dedicated line that she's made, started to make a wait a call list to be able to reach out to when the vaccine comes and when we have more information. Um, we are also going to engage and do promotion by using all of the traditional media outlets that Brianna uses when any kind of widespread notification goes out. And then also one thing that we're really happy to announce is that uh, we're gonna be doing a, a call-in show, if you will, on Tuesday, February 2nd at 7 p.m. Um, I'm very excited about this for a, for a Q&A, a great opportunity to have a table um, and a platform with, with myself as the health director with Mary Beth Ogilevitz from the senior services there, and then some Cooley Dickinson medical professionals to be um, to join us as well as experts in this field and to be able to maybe answer some questions in terms of how maybe Cooley Dickinson might be able to help support our local efforts as well. And, and that Zoom will be, will, we will be sending out once it's available. Next slide. And I wanted to end this with these links that individuals can find regularly updated information at. I think one of the challenges with the information changing so frequently is that, you know, I'm looking at this stuff many times throughout the day, and even that can change during the day when I'm looking at it. So I really try to use these state resources, these state links to give the best information. Um, we also update our local Amherst COVID-19 site with information when we're able to, and when we have testing, not testing, sorry, when we're gonna be having a vaccine uh, clinic um, out, but this link in terms of when can I get, get the COVID vaccine, vaccine, that's great for the phased updates. They try to update that on Tuesdays and Thursdays because they're constantly evaluating those groupings for priority. And then also just overview in terms of the entire vaccination program throughout the entire state is that second link. And that's all I got for now. Thank you so much, Emma. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad I was able to come. And thank you for staying on top of this and all the work that you and your colleagues are doing. Um, we're going to move on to another piece that I wanna make sure we announce and that people understand it. Um, the Governance Organization Legislation Committee has asked that we add the feature of a clock for timing both public comment and counselor comments. And so Sean and Athena have worked on that. And I've asked them to demonstrate that at this point. So basically what Sean has done is he's put the clock in his surface. And as long as we don't keep seeing his head or the posted over his film, we'll see the number so that it will uh, basically count down from three minutes and you will know when three minutes is up. Okay, we'll only be using that during public comment and during uh, council comments. Okay, we're going to move on then to general public comment. So this is the only public comment this evening. Uh, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at a 
and based on the number of people who wish to speak. Uh, the council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Um, and so I'm going to ask people who would like to make public comment to raise their hands. Okay, and the way we do this is we invite you into the room um, and you uh, into the panelist area and we ask you to state your name and where you live and then uh, you proceed and so forth. So we start with Aaron Hayden. Please come into the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I, well, I'm Aaron Hayden and I live in District 5 down here in South Amherst. I guess I'm flattered that I get to try out the be the first one to try out the clock. This is a, an exciting update. In any event, it's good to speak to uh, all about the improvements the town is considering for the uh, Pomeroy Road West Street intersection. I chair the Transportation Advisory Committee and wanted to take a moment of public comment to talk about the planning for this intersection since you'll all be looking at it a little bit later and to consider its reference. The intersection between the arterial West Street and the residential Pomeroy Lanes in the middle of a growing village center has been thought about for a long time and planning its improvement has been the subject of requests for funding before. The community has grown quite a bit since the traffic control and non-automotive access for this intersection was designed many years ago. We don't do intersections like that anymore when we can help it. Um, I don't know if you've ever been through it. You see it's a dreadful place to try to cross. There are many new families joining the community that are within walking distance of the services in the village that the village center provides. And the amount of traffic on West Street continues to grow. As we move through the planning for this intersection, oh, I heard a comment. Uh, I, I, I wrote this out so it could just like go through it. As we move through the planning for this intersection, the Transportation Advisory Committee is hopeful that the priority on the design and um, the priority of the basis of design for the work shifts from one of shifts towards the community's safe and comfortable use of the intersection and away from the old idea of speeding more cars through. Um, at the District 5 meeting, some of you heard from neighbors uh, in this community on the strong desire for safe, and I want to add attractive, a pedestrian crossing here. Um, the idea is that when this intersection was built, you know, 50 years ago, it really was designed to move cars and ignore its people as they often did in the day. Um, and it's very important that we change that, that we get back to the pedestrians. We feel it is important that the nearby intersections oh, uh, are kept in mind as well as this work goes forward. All of those intersections face the same challenge of safety, supporting more people from the community as they walk and bike across and along West Street. I'm going to stop now because my time is running out, and I'm going to look forward to seeing the presentation a little bit later. Thanks so much. Thank you, Aaron, and thanks for your work on the TAC. Yeah. Um, Harry Mullen, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Harry Mullen and I'm on Northeast Street in District 4. Um, I'm speaking tonight to ask the council to consider adding the following language to the resolution about the insurgents on Capitol Hill. Um, I'm going to start with by quoting the part that I what imagine it would be added to. Um, so be it further resolved, we call on the town manager to condemn the actions of the insurrectionists and enact practices, behaviors, and policies to ensure that planned peaceful demonstrations by black, brown, and indigenous people are responded to by law enforcement and public safety personnel in an anti-racist manner consistent with the freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution and exhibit no greater force, uh, no greater show of force than is routinely used in peaceful demonstrations by white people. I'd like you to add and ensure that no Amherst town employee who has sworn to uphold the laws and Constitution of the United States or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts participated in the violence and siege of the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, and 
Be it further resolved, we call upon the Amherst Police Department, Chief Livingstone, to affirm their commitment to civilian oversight of policing in Amherst, as well as their commitment to protecting citizens in the democratic process. I sent this earlier and I got a clarification, um, which is why I took out one part about keeping the two officer positions frozen. Um, and I, I, I got a response from Councilor DeAngelis saying that if a town employee did something illegal in DC on January 6th, uh, it's the purview of whatever law enforcement groups that are investigating and prosecuting the people involved is not a town action and therefore cannot be added to the resolution. I uh, personally disagree because um, there are standards of conduct that law enforcement and town officials must be held to. It seems to me as an outsider looking in to be a uh, very commonplace uh, for people's conduct to be questioned by media um, and other folks. So it seems reasonable um, as the town council who's in my understanding are the current supervisors of uh, most of the town that you could look into the current conduct of your employees. Um, and then I also wanted to add, because I'm a little uh, confused on the who can freeze the police positions. Um, it seems like they are moving forward as being frozen until the uh, CSWG um, can finish their report. Um, I would like to speak in favor of that. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Terry. Um, and Bertie is the next person and state your full name and where you live. Hi, um, I'm Bertie Newman. Uh, I am a high school student in District 4 um, and I'm speaking as a member of Defund 413 Amherst. Um, I'm really glad the town is putting out a resolution in response to the insurrection at the Capitol. Uh, in terms of the freeze on the police officer positions, I am following Terry in supporting that. I hope um, that town council members support the motion to extend that freeze today so that um, they can get the feedback that they'd initially envisioned from the community safety working group. That seems really crucial. Um, I also agree that to the extent um, that Amherst can look into their employees conduct and ensure that no one was at the insurrection. I think that's really, um, I think that's really important. And I don't know all the legal stuff around it, but we saw that there was um, a version of the resolution that had that in there that was like, yeah, we're gonna look into this and make sure nobody was there. Um, and I am curious why that got removed and what it might look like to add it back in or to amend it and add it back in um, so that those are my comments for today. Thank you. Thank you, Bertie. Glad you could join us. Myra Ross, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Myra, you need to unmute. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, I am here. Uh, oh, I'm Myra Ross. I live in District 4. Um, I'm representing the Disability Access Advisory Committee. Um, we sent a memo to you regarding the Pomeroy Lane intersection. Um, and it's for us, it's very crucial um, that you think along the lines that Aaron Hayden already asked you to think along, thinking about pedestrian safety rather than just zooming cars through, because it is a very busy crossing intersection. And we are very concerned that, that it could end up being made like the Triangle Street um, Rotary uh, roundabout was made, which is very unsafe for visually impaired people, for blind people, for anybody who walks slowly because there's no way to slow the traffic. So I don't know yet what we want you to do, but I know that pedestrian safety and pedestrian safety for people with disabilities, including blindness and mobility impairments has to be your paramount concern when you um, design the intersection rather than moving the cars through quickly. Myra, thank you for your comment. Allegra. Please state your full name and where you live. 
My name is Allegra Clark and I am a resident of District 4. Um, I am also speaking tonight in support of the resolution against the insurrection. I think you guys for taking a stand on that. I do think it's important for the public to know whether or not there were any Amherst officers involved, um, as we have seen reports that there were local law enforcement personnel present at the Capitol on that day. And in addition, I would just ask that the Community Safety Working Group, which has been doing very good work trying to look at all the angles um, that it's been asked to tackle, be given the opportunity to fulfill their mission and ask that the extension that they're requesting is granted and that with that, the two police officer positions will remain frozen until they're able to come up with some of the possible alternatives for policing in the town. Legra, thank you for your comments. Are there any other public comments at this time? Okay, seeing none, then we are going to return to the agenda and we're going to move on to the consent agenda, which tonight is quite short, um, but can we show it on the screen? In the meantime, I will read the motion and look for a second. Uh, just a reminder, the consent agenda, the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect that they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when I list the consent agenda items. The request to remove does not require a second. Um, the motion is to move the following items in printed motion and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. Suspension of town council rules of procedure rule 8.4 for agenda item 8C, amendments to the town manager goals. This is so that we can pass either pass those tonight or not. Uh, the other two are minutes 11A to C, Approve of, it's actually A to B, approval of minutes, uh, December 5th, 2020, special town council meeting minutes. That was the four towns meetings. And December 21st, 2020, regular town council meeting minutes. Is there a second? Second, Ross. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hold on, I need to exit the full screen and just see if there's any hands. Okay, then this requires a roll call vote. I'm going to begin with Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy DeMont. Darcy DuMont. Sorry, yes. And Griesmer is an aye. Haneke? Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. And Shalini Balmilne. Yes. The vote is 13 for, none against, none abstained, and none absent. We are going to move on to. Um, the next item on our agenda, and this is a reworking of the agenda. So we have moved item 7A, the report from the Community Safety Working Group, forward. And before I call on Paul Bachman and Paul Wiley, Chair of the Community Safety Working Group, and Brianna Owen, Vice Chair, I also want to recognize the other members, some of whom are with us tonight in the audience. Tashina Bowman, Darius Cage, Deborah Ferreria. Ferre I'm going to just apologize for pronouncing that. Pat Onabaku, uh, Russ Vernon Jones, Alicia Walk, and Alicia Walker. And also thank Jennifer Moyston, who is the staff liaison. So with that, I'm going to also mention that the vote to extend the deadline and continue to freeze the positions will be later in the agenda. The purpose of this agenda item 
is to hear a report from the work, Public Safety Working Group. Paul, do you wanna in introduce further? Yes, I will, thank you very much. So uh, later in the, in the um, committee meeting, uh, there will be a request uh, to extend the deadline for delivering a report to extend to, um, for two months. Uh, and, that, and there's also a, a, conti a contingency that there, we will hold those, uh, those two positions vacant until that is done as well. So that should be a clear understanding. So we're just holding everything and giving the working group more time. The working group's been a spectacular group working together and taking on a very large task. And I credit the, two, the leaders of the group, uh, Mr. Wiley uh, and Ms. Owen, and turn it over to them for their presentation. They've done a good job in putting a presentation together. Okay, and would you please pull the presentation up, Sean? And I'm gonna go ahead, Paul, as soon as it's up. Thank you. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Um, we want to thank the, the town council for giving us this opportunity to update you on the work of the community safety working group. And um, thank you also for introducing all of us. Um, we'd like for you to know that uh, uh, Ms. Owen and myself are here representing the entire group. And I want to echo the, the comments already made that this group has been working extremely hard and putting in a lot of long hours already to begin what is a, a pretty daunting task, but something that's very doable in, in our eyes and very necessary for this town. Um, before we go any further, I just want to say that we, we started our work at the end of November slash beginning of December. So we're, we're about eight weeks into the, the work of this group. And we're finding that the, the, the volume of work coming in and the volume of, of uh, tasks that we have to do is, part of, is, is behind some of the, the, the requests for an extension. Uh, I think we, we're all committed to doing the work in the best possible way and, and going to really deep dive at this. So we hope that that extension can be approved um, going forward. So uh, on behalf of uh, Ms. Owen and myself, thank you for having us here and we can launch right into the, the next slide. So this is coming from our, our original document and the purpose of the community safety working group is twofold, twofold to make recommendations on alternative ways of providing public safety services to the community and to make recommendations on reforms to the current organizational and oversight structures of the Amherst Police Department. You'll see as we go down further that um, there's a lot behind those two statements and it comes in the form of the articulation of our charge, which is the, um, I believe on the next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So I think I'll just go to the first part. So you're, I'm not, you know, monopolizing all the the airtime here, and I I want to defer to um, um, Ms. Owen to go to the second um, uh, set of bullets beyond the first three. But we're planning to study the the complex issues uh, of delivering community safety services uh, currently provided through the police. We're recommending reforms um, at the culmination of our work to the current organizational and oversight structures. And we're examining existing town funding priorities for delivering community safety services. So all of these things in combination will be part of what we, we submit at the, the end of our, our tenure as, as a working group. Uh, Ms. Owen, maybe you wanna go through the, the next, next yeah. section? Um, so the working group is achieving this by learning from the previous work by um, work done by the town through previous studies and committees, examining current public safety services and how they're delivered, reviewing policies, complaints, current training practices, exploring models of resident oversight of police departments, collecting data from lived experiences in Amherst, engaging the communities most impacted by police 
um, by policing to develop alternatives and identify solutions to diagnose problems and investigating alternative models such as the Eugene Cahoots um, crisis assistance helping out on the street in the Albuquerque community safety um, alternative. Thank you. Well, we can move to the next slide. So the work thus far, um, I think Ms. Owen, I'll go through the first five of these and maybe you can do the last three. I, I, I just wanna to say too, I wanna to interject that we're moving through this at a fairly rapid pace, but we're hoping to leave a few moments uh, certainly for uh, you to ask any questions and uh, those things that we can answer tonight, we certainly will. However, if there's something that uh, needs more work on our part, we will move that back to our working group and be happy to return those answers to the town council uh, in a timely manner. So some of these things are, are very you know, straightforward. We elected a chair and a vice chair, uh, held eight meetings. Uh, our agenda is public and uh, on the uh, Amherst website, public comment is welcomed at the beginning of every meeting conducted research on policing at the state and national level, attended webinars and viewed podcasts, and we've solicited and received additional resources such as articles, upcoming workshops, books, et cetera, from the community. I wanna say, given that, I said when we first started, it was pretty slow, but now our, our presence in the town and um, as a result of our two forums that, uh, uh, we, we've already held, we're, we're getting a lot of traction within our community and we've been blessed by the amount of, of input people are giving us. We've certainly been uh, welcoming uh, resources and suggestions and the, the, the town has, has met that challenge completely and we, we're happy to receive that and internalize it in our work. So, uh, Ms. Sowen? Of course. Um, outside of our research, we've also been in um, communication with the Amherst Police Department. So we've put together a list of questions so we can learn more about their policies, practices, and different information that we feel will lead our work. Um, we've received those responses and requested additional information. We have done two public forums on two separate dates to hear lived experiences from the community with the Amherst Police Department and Safety Services. Um, and we've asked that the community gives us their input on what they'd like to see in reform. And we've, we have also created a survey online for people who couldn't make it for the forum to the forum so that um, they can remain anonymous but still provide feedback for our work through lived experiences and suggestions for alternative work, um, alternative safety services. Thank you. Can you move that forward? Um, so this is a copy of the flyer that we put together for our two separate forums. And um, Ms. Moyston was also able to help us put together a little QR code for um, our surveys. So there's these flyers um, in various locations in the community. So people knew about our forums and so they can see and scan the QR code to reach the anonymous survey. Thank you. So in terms of the next action, the steps and actions, um, one of the, the, the major tasks we're engaged in right now is acquiring um, missing data from the Amherst Police Department. And I wanna say a little bit about that. Um, the number of questions and categories we sent to the Amherst Police Department was pretty extensive. And um, much of that information is uh, available Sometimes it's not available in the form that we can use it to best analyze and uh, review our current situation in Amherst. And a lot of it has to be done by hand. So we have received some information. We processed some of that information. We've gone back to the Amherst Police Department and they just recently submitted a second round of responses to us, which we are now 
taking a look at uh, more closely. And we're just trying to find out where the gaps are in terms of what we know and what we don't know, and certainly what we need to know in order to uh, be able to inform our recommendations going forward. We are, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from Amherst nonprofits and organizations. Again, this is where the extensive work comes from. We've certainly heard from, heard from some people already and some organizations um, at, at, during our forums, but we hope, hope to it, it extend our reach into the community more, more deeply through some other uh, strategies where we'll get a chance to hear from organizations more closely in terms of dialogue and, and discourse. And we're considering a virtual meeting with the Amherst Police Department that is yet to be formalized. But I think at some point, there's only so much you can do with the uh, with surveys and, and data and those kinds of things coming across in terms of emails and letters and those types of things. At some point, we have to have a, a conversation. So we're hoping at some point to have this, uh, this uh, virtual meeting with the Amherst Police Department so we can have an in-person conversation. And I guess the last one, then I'll turn it over to um, Ms. Ms. Owen, is reviewing our survey responses. You know, Ms. Owen mentioned that the survey, and we hope to get more survey responses than we already have. Certainly people in the community have been very responsive to this, and it, it is available on the website. So we're hoping that uh, We'll, we'll continue to get more information. The more information we have from the, the broadest range of participants, the, the better we stand in terms of making uh, recommendations for our community. Ms. Owen? Um, so we are right now, we're looking for a consultant to help us with research. As we dive deeper into this work, we realize through people sharing lived experiences and through our own research that community safety overlaps with education in different institutional in different institutions in the community. So we believe a consultant would be able to help us do our work better and more thoroughly. Um, we are going to continue to do outreach in the community and move toward recommendations. And we hope to secure the essential resources needed to organize and process our data, broaden and deepen our community outreach, and eventually create um, a final report in June of this year. Okay. I guess the next slide. So this is our final slide and, and I wanted to refer back to to um, uh, Ms. Griesmer. Um, after this, I would like to welcome questions. If um, members of the town council have them, would that be appropriate at that time after this slide? Absolutely. And then um, Ms. Owen and I have um, a comment we'd like to make in the form of a letter coming from our community's safety working group. We'd like to uh, leave that with you at the end. Thank you. Okay. So one of the, the things around the town council that we're looking for is to help spread the word about our community survey. That seems to be a, a very quick and easy way for people who have access certainly to it to, uh, to be able to share their thoughts with our community safety working group. That's an important piece of our, our research. And we, we need that from our community. So we were hoping that the town council and other town agencies um, will, will, will also support that work, you know, on our behalf. Um, attend our public meetings and forums to, to listen. And the last thing is the, is the comment I wanted to, to make at the end, but I thought at this point I would stop and uh, see if the, the town council has any comments or questions about our work that uh, Ms. Owen and I can, can field at this point and uh, perhaps answer. And if not, as I said, we'll, we'll dig back in and, and get those answers to you as soon as possible. And I wanna again, thank you for putting this together. I wanna to thank um, you all for the technical support putting this up. Ms. Owen is being a, a little modest here. She, she, she actually did the, uh, the flyers. She made the flyers. Uh, she 
you know, she made this presentation, she put this presentation together. So uh, I'm glad she did it and not me. So that's why it came out so good. So we want to thank her for, for all that extra effort. And I also want to thank again uh, for our members too in this group who are putting in numerous hours behind the scene reading and writing and thinking about this work. So it's not just meeting to meeting, but there's a, a thread of commitment going through this group that I, I think is gonna work well for us uh, going forward. So thank you both. Thank you all again. And thank you for having uh, Ms. Owen and I speak. We'd be happy to take on any questions you might have at this point. Great. Uh, first of all, we've looked forward to hearing from you. And while some members have been able to attend your meetings and listen to them, um, and uh, many of us were able to attend the two public forums and enjoyed the, and really, I, I don't want to say enjoyed, but really um, were very, very interested to hear the comments that you were able to uh, receive from residents and former residents of Amherst. Um, we also want to thank the working group. Uh, having been on working groups like this, when you're meeting once a week, the turnaround time is extremely short. And to pack all of this work into uh, the kind of time frame that we had to give you or, and that we did give you is commendable. Um, we want to also make sure that you are welcome to come back anytime you would like and provide us with any announcements that you would like to make and make sure are made during our council meetings. We will do them at the beginning of the announcements just the way they, we did now. And if there's special announcements beyond just meetings, we also um, tend to make those in, you know, by announcing them as well as in print. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I'm going to ask counselors if they have questions. And the first name that I see is Kathy Shane. Hi, um, I want to echo Lynn's thanks. I thought uh, both the presentation was superb. And I went and looked at your survey. Um, and whoever designed that survey, I think it's excellent. It really leaves a lot of space um, to probe personal and family, but other experiences. Um, so I have one comment and then a couple of questions. One is, um, I think the larger uh, title um, was racial and social justice. And I think a lot of the interactions have a lot to have as much to do or a lot to do with class as well as race. That um, if, if you're lower income and you're not used to confronting authority, you're afraid. So make sure you capture some of that, you know, uh, uh, just uh, um, I experiences. So encourage people to be reporting on that as well, that just you felt um, you, you didn't know how to respond. Um, so my, my questions were um, where and how we can help um, get more responses back to you. So I didn't know whether you've gone to the schools and thought of a way of having the schools uh, announce that there is this survey and get the experience of elementary, middle and high school students and or their families to report up. Can they feature it on the school website? Can they do it in a flyer? Um, we've got district councils, uh, district meetings, and we can certainly do that in a meeting and put your how to find the survey up. And then up in where my district is, it's up in the north of Amherst, and we have pockets of very low income and uh, multiple racial culture. And I'm just thinking of how we could go to some of those, I mean, if there are flyers that can be distributed to let people know that this is available because they might not otherwise. So, so any ideas you have when you said, how can we be helpful? I think we would like to be helpful to get input. And my last question was about the type of consultant you're looking for. So um, for, for what kinds of things? Um, I have, a, from other walks of life, a larger circle, but I don't know whether um, that circle would be useful or not. So it's both schools, you know, how can we be helpful at the district level with flyers and then the type of consultant you're looking for? 
Okay, maybe I can I can start in working working backwards uh, uh, very quickly, uh, and maybe Ms. Owen, you could speak to the the, the further outreach um, pieces of that. Let me let me first say that uh, you know uh, uh, Mr. Brockelman, who has been uh, with us in 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 this work, has been you know very supportive as uh, you know in terms of what we might need in terms of uh, resources. And I say that broadly in terms of resources. Sometimes that's a matter of, of people, sometimes it's a matter of materials, sometimes it's a matter of time. So I think we're, we're right at the cusp of making uh, a more formal recommendation to, uh, to Mr. Bachelman. We We've already uh, put some things um, on his desk. He's responded to us, uh, already so we're engaged in that process and i think at this point we uh we have to make some decisions on how specific we want to be around the resources we need so we can get exactly what we need to do the work we need to do so I, i'm confident that that will happen um let me just say off the top quickly i know we're going to need some help with uh collecting and analyzing data I think that's going to be a huge thing because there's so much information out there. I think we're probably going to need some information, I mean, some support and uh, and help around putting reports together and getting them in the form that's uh, usable for readers, as well as informative to the community. So those two things just off the top of my head are, you know, these are things we, you know, have to discuss further with the, with our group, certainly. But, uh, we're right in the thick of that because at this point, we're we're starting to move with some more deliberate speed than we were in the first few weeks of our work, and so having those resources in place is important. And I, and I feel we can we can get to that point pretty quickly. Um, Ms. Owen, I don't know if in terms of the other questions about the approach, the outreach in schools and et cetera. Help with outreach in schools, I think, would be really helpful if any of you would be able to help aid in that. Um, in regards to the flyer for the survey, what I'm thinking um, of bringing to the next meeting we have with the Community Safety Working Group is making another flyer with just the survey link in the QR code because the forums have already passed. So I don't want people to see that, see the dates, and not read all the way down to the survey. So once I read, once I put something else together, I think that would be great if we could um, spread that out around town wherever that could be <laughs> and extra hands are always needed and thankful <laughs> yeah, I to... and i think that just one other piece about the class piece I, I think that's a that's important to to note because the these um they're connected quite tightly and um you know race and class uh do intermingle in terms of whether people are getting treated fairly, uh, if social justice is being implemented in the proper ways across the board. And uh, I think we put racial out there and, and social justice because that's the that's kind of the overall thing. You know, if, the, if there's no racial and social, if there's no social justice, for example, um, there, there's no economic justice as well so yeah. i think we're you know we're, we're we we understand that and uh but you're highlighting that uh, uh ms shown is uh, is extremely important to hear and, and we'll i didn't mean it as a criticism i just meant so that yeah. other people feel invited in where yeah. they've had the kind of experience and it's because um uh, yeah they were vulnerable for other kinds of reasons that were related to income and social status yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Andy Steinberg, do you have your hand up? Yes, thank you. Um, actually, I'm building a little bit on what Kathy said, but with a slightly different perspective, um, one that I had shared with the council in the previous meeting, and that is that um, my background before I uh, got involved with town government was that I was uh, 
the director of uh, Western Massachusetts Legal Services, which is now Community Legal Aid. And in that capacity, what we were providing was civil legal assistance to people who were in poverty. And um, that was a group that um, was sort of implicit a little bit in what Kathy was talking about, but not totally uh, because I really am focusing on people in poverty. And I come at it from two different ways. One is from my experience in those uh, years that I was working in legal aid, which is, uh, you know, 30 years, um, that uh, people who are um, in poverty are frequently the victims of crime um, and also uh, frequently the people who are affected if there is some type of police misconduct in a community so that they really are affected in both ways. But that there's also the problem that poverty in and of itself is a barrier to participation. And I did talk with the uh, current managing attorney of the office that covers Hampshire County and asked her how we um, at Legal Aid are now serving people in this COVID era where there were um, no in-person court appearances or administrative hearing appearances going on. And um, she acknowledged that it is a large problem because of um, the need for technology and the access to technology. So I, um, my that gets to my question is, what kinds of efforts um, have you made or have you thought about that would make sure that we are reaching that population that um, has technological barriers uh, to being able to participate in either Zoom type of meetings um, or even getting access to technology to respond to surveys and, um, that are uh, based on computer uh, usage. Thank you for those those comments. And uh, I think I, I kind of have to go back to uh, some other experiences I've had in, in this town being in the school system for some time and knowing how difficult it is to uh, access certain resources and certain information um, be, because of the limitations of, of time and personal resources that many, many families do have. I think what you're talking about might come further down the line in terms of recommendations, because if we're talking about increasing the level of participation across the community, we're going to have to find ways to in, increase and open uh, access ways for all people to be uh, participants in, in this, you know, civic venture, if you will. And I, and I, you know, so we're, we, this is something we will certainly talk about. We, we're not looking at this in a pocketed fashion, certainly. And I think your, your comments, Mr. Steinberg, in this show are showing and demonstrating again, how systemic this is and how, you know, structurally it could be, um, you know, work against people if we don't do it right. So I, I I'm, I'm, taking into account what you said and what Michonne said, certainly to say, these things will most likely be embedded in what we recommend. Uh, for example, I mean, just the fact that we have a, a Zoom meeting, uh, pretty simple for me, maybe simple for other people, maybe not for some others. And uh, those others may have some very important, uh, Im important things to say uh, important things that contribute, but their voices aren't heard for reasons not that you know are not their fault. So how do we raise those voices? How do we open them up? And how do we you know give people access? Again, that's a social justice issue. So uh, you know I appreciate what what you said. And I think that that could be coming down the line, and it makes perfect sense. Ms. Owen, I I know. Um, I don't really, I don't have much to add. I'm glad that you brought it up though. I do think technological um, setbacks do exist. Um, I guess as 
I don't know. I work with young people who are 18 through 26, and I also work with young kids who are in the foster care system. And um, the strength of this area in Western Mass is the school system. So one thing I've noticed more recently is more young people are working with organizations who can aid them in things like Chromebooks, cell phones, things like that to keep them connected. But I do really appreciate your comment, um, and I hope that we can find a way to hear the lived experiences of those that might not have a phone or a laptop to hop on Zoom or fill out a survey. Thank you. Uh, Shalini. Hi. Uh, I also just want to thank you again, each one of you. This, I attended a couple of your meetings and there's so much work that's going on there. So really, thank you. Um, the thing that I wanted to bring up was what I heard in one of the forums about the UMass police. And I don't know if that's something that is within the domain of your work or is that something you need will or need to look at? Um, and the other um, thing that I definitely support um, that you are hiring a researcher. And if you've heard me before, you probably know that I would recommend a human centered design research because, especially given that we are in a COVID time and it's so hard to reach out to people and communities and seeing the work uh, of some of the human centered design around policing. They've come up with really creative ways of um, engaging different communities. And a lot of that work is used for social problems. So uh, I know that there are a few human-centered design researchers at UMass and Hampshire College. So that would be, uh, I think, cool. And um, also the other thing I was thinking was in terms of within the BIPOC communities, whether um, there's a way to reach out to different groups within that, for example, um, just BIPOC owned businesses and what might be their specific experiences or students, what are their experiences and then residents in different districts or so just kind of finding a way to reach out to all of them. And again, um, did anyone see how we're helping with the school? I think that's a great idea to use the schools, maybe mobile food markets or other such venues where we can have ways to interact with um, different people. League of Women Voters came up to another data. Okay, that's all. And please, please do let us know how we can continue to support your work. Well, this, in, this inter interchange right now is very supportive. I mean, mm -hmm. if we can continue this kind of uh, interaction, it's extremely helpful and informative to us. I do want to say that uh, the, the working group that we have have quite a varied background and uh, they individually and we collectively uh, bring a number of different resources to bear. So some of the things that are being suggested, suggested here fall into the bailiwick of some of the, uh, the experiences and, and knowledge base uh, that we have right on our, on our very group, which I'm fortunate to be a part of. So, you know, taking this in and I'm, you know, some of them are, are, I haven't looked at the attendee list certainly, but some of them are, if not all of them are, are on this, um, this meeting right now. So they're listening and I'm sure they're taking in information uh, as we, as Ms. Owen and I are. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments or questions at this time? Okay, seeing none, then I'm going to turn back to uh, Mr. Wiley and uh, Ms. Owen. So thank you again for, for this you know, opportunity and the invitation to have um, additional opportunities going forward. And we hope you will continue to support us as you have been doing and certainly tonight. Uh, I want to preface this statement I'm reading uh, on behalf of the Community Safety Working Group to state very plainly that this is extremely difficult work. It requires uh, much from us, all of us on, uh, on a number of levels. So this, this comment uh, and letter that we're submitting comes with the deepest respect for our work and also the, the, the 
the deepest respect for our community and what we need to support going forward in order to uh, make some of the things that we want to have happen happen in a way that's going to have meaning for not only our BIPOC community, but for all members of our community. So I'm going to read a statement that in the form of a letter to the council, and then I think we'll we'll be done, uh, Ms. Reedner. Mr. Wiley, do you want me to read um, the second page and you read the first page since it's a little bit lengthier? Sure, that would be great. Thank you. Or you can read the first page if you want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and I'll finish. Okay. Dear Town Council, we are writing to you with a sense of deep obligation to hold leaders in our community accountable for their words and actions. Our group and community were harmed by the actions of town, member, of town council member Elisa Brewer during the community forum on public safety that was held January 16th, 2021 via Zoom. The space we created was clearly defined as one for residents to share their stories and experiences and to communicate their knowledge and expertise with our group, a designated town body made up of BIPOC community members. During the meeting, we aim to practice progressive stacking by asking BIPOC community members to share their comments first. This is a practice used to increase equity in meeting spaces. It was also specifically said in our opening statement that while we would not be responding to comments from the community, we intended to listen deeply and respectfully so that the community feedback could help inform our work moving forward. The purpose of this forum was to create a safe space for BIPOC residents to do so. The Community Safety Working Group is one of two official bodies made up of BIPOC community members. At the start of our BIPOC-centered forum, Ms. Brewer publicly reprimanded our group's tardiness and compliance with the open meeting laws. Although this comment may have been intended to be supportive, it is important to recognize the difference between intention and the real life impact these actions have within our society and within our own community. The impact of these actions brought up feelings of anger within our group, distracted us from our important work, and created mistrust between this group and our fellow town leaders. We have spent a great deal of collective time thinking and healing as a result of these outrageous comments that could have been spent on our work or time with our families. This is what racism looks like. This is unacceptable and we deserve respect. We're creating a safe space for we are creating a safe space for folks traditionally marginalized by town governance systems. As an, elective, as an elected official, it is your responsibility to represent our community and it is your responsibility to be aware of the power dynamics that exist in this position. Instead, Ms. Brewer disregarded, disrespected, and harmed members of our community by speaking directly in response to a community member defending herself while discrediting their voice and lived experiences. The impact of this is detrimental to the community safety working group's work and causes the BIPOC community members to fear being reprimanded and retaliation in their own town if they step forward to share their truth in the future. These are the very, these are the very actions that perpetuate and enable systemic racism to continue within our governing and political bodies, and it must stop. The implication and the impact on our communities are massive and deserve acknowledgement and repair. The, the town has asked the community safety working group to hold spaces to hear from <clears throat> and inform decisions within our community. With this comes immense bravery and responsibility. We take seriously this responsibility and know that it is our job and yours to represent our community. We cannot do this if town officials publicly denounce community members and their lived experiences. We must represent and not disregard our community. These racist actions are why this group is so important because there is very little representation in the town's governing bodies. These actions mirror what happens in our town at large, disregard for the authority of BIPOC leaders and continuous microaggressions or macroaggressions towards BIPOC community members who raise injustices causing immense harm. The Community Safety and Working Group respectfully requests that the Town Council do not give public comment or respond to public comments given at BIPOC-centered forums. We also urge the Town Council to invest in anti-racist education and work and to publicly acknowledge their own privilege and power dynamics when representing our community. 
We enjoyed a strong turnout for our community forums and gained important insight into the experiences of individuals in the community with the Amherst Police Department. We want to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak before the working group. And I believe we fulfill that responsibility in both of our community forums. We plan to address our BIPOC community in a separate letter to convey that we feel deep guilt in allowing the spaces we promised would be safe to be invaded by a white person in a position of power. To know that we are committed to the community safety working group's work and that we will center BIPOC community members in a more thoughtful way moving forward. The community safety working group would welcome an apology from Ms. Brewer, acknowledging the egregious nature of the comments and its impact on our work and a commitment to refrain from repeating that behavior in the future. In addition, we would welcome a commitment from the town council to monitor and continually educate its members on how difficult it often is for community members to speak in public and raise their level of awareness to this fact. And we end by saying, if you have any further questions, uh, please email the group directly at our email address cswg at amherstmass.gov. And Ms. Owen and I wanna thank you for listening to us and hearing what we had to say this evening. And thank you for your, your contributions. Let me just conclude this part of our meeting by stating the following. Um, because uh, through Mr. Bachman, uh, I was able to connect with Mr. Wiley this weekend and also able to view various tapes which have now been shared with everybody in the council. I've spent a number of, spent some time talking with a council, councilman, councilor Alyssa Brewer, and she has, as of six o'clock this evening, posted various documents, including an apology in our packet. And those were sent directly to Mr. Wiley so that he can make them available to his committee. Uh, furthermore, as I have stated to both the town council and to Mr. Wiley and Ms. Owen, uh, the town council will also respond to your letter. However, the response will require that a draft pre be presented at a full town council meeting and that there be a vote for the president to send the letter with any amendments asked by the council. We all want that letter to be responsive and, we, and not be done in haste. Therefore, as a town council, we will have a draft response for a review at our meeting on February 8th. I have already informed the chair and vice chair, as I mentioned before, of the community safety working group of this process. Um, I would like to suggest that we not move on with further comment and we move on to the next um, portion of our agenda, if that is acceptable to everybody else. And again, we want to thank both Brianna and Ms. Paul Wiley for being with us this evening. This has been a most informative conversation and we stand ready to help you in every way possible, including we have five district meetings coming up during February and we'll make sure that all of the information that we can have uh, out there for people in our district letters as well will be there. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and, and the, the time you devoted to this. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Come back anytime. So we are going to actually take a brief five minute break and come back. We would like to move on to the Belchertown Road property acquisition for affordable housing uh, with various reports and council discussion and a vote. Please mute your mics and when you come back put your picture back up so that I know you're there thank you pretty much all back I'm going to quickly make sure the counselors are reconnected I'm going to start with um Pat DeAngelis present uh Darcy Dumont here and Lynn Griesmer is here Mindy Johanneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. 
Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Out of breath, but present. Matthew Sheen. Here. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Yeah, uh, Sarah Schwartz. Present. Shalini Baumilm. I'm here. Melissa Brewer. Present. Thank you. Um, so I skipped over the proclamation. We are not skipping over it, but I learned that one of the people involved in the Belchertown Road property has a time constraint this evening. And so we're going to move forward with the Belchertown Road property and then come back to the, um, and probably then do Promeroy Village and then do the proclamation. Is there any objection to that from the council? Okay, seeing none. Um, so we're going to do the Belchertown Road property. We have a finance committee report. We have a community resources committee report. There's further opportunity for council discussion. And then we have a motion and vote. So uh, Andy or Kathy, whichever of you is giving the finance report. Yes, as you, um, most of the council knows, I was uh, uh, otherwise uh, preoccupied after our meeting uh, on this, uh, January 5th. And uh, Kathy Shane, as uh, vice chair, took over and drafted the report and is going to present it tonight. Thank you, Andy. Um, since you all got the report a few days ago, and I hope, hope I've had time to read it, I'm just going to highlight um, some of what we put in the report. Um, the first and probably most important is that we unanimously recommend um, going forward with the order to purchase the property. And the order has three main parts. One is it authorizes the town manager to purchase the three properties. It Secondly, it appropriates 600,000 from CPA funds and authorizes borrowing of this amount and principal and debt service to be repaid by CPA. And third, um, it authorizes the town manager to enter into a long-term lease or some fee arrangement with the development company for purposes of developing uh, community housing. So it's, it's a purchase order, but it also sets us on the road of developing these affordable, uh, this very exciting opportunity um, to purchase these three properties. The finance committee found that the proposed project is sound, financially feasible, and raises no legal concerns and is consistent with the Community Preservation Act. Moreover, as we've stated in the past, um, the, it's well within the purview of the CPAC committee, but also the way uh, Community Preservation Act works to enter into debt arrangements mm -hmm. and repayment of loan from CPA money. There was a, a report that we got that showed in out years that this CPA will still have resources beyond the um, debt that they're incurring here. So it's, it is a financially sound proposal. There were just a few things that came up during the review that I thought were worth highlighting for everyone. The CPA, the definition of affordable goes up to 100% of area median. And this reaches well into workforce incomes. For example, and this is in the report for a family of four, that's up to $119,000 or for single person, it's 83,000. The state definition of affordable for subsidy is at 80% um, range. And that is also at the lower end of moderate income. So the RFP that can follow with this within CPA guidelines can have quite a range of incomes within the new development that will all be considered affordable. It's not just poverty, but it's solidly into the workforce. John Hornick made this point um, during his presentation. Secondly, um, it can be packaged with the East Street School if there's a decision to do that. And that reaches a scale with the new development plus each school that makes it very attractive for a developer because it spreads the overhead cost of applying for state funds over a larger number of units. It's both financially more feasible and you reach economies of scale. 
The other um, point that in initial presentation, we were told about houses that are on two of the properties. And initially it was thought that we'd be able to um, gain rental income from these houses. After legal counsel review, the decision and advice was only one of the houses that's currently under a lease would be rented up until the end of the current lease, but we wouldn't continue to rent it because we can't manage it using CPA funds. Um, those funds would recoup. So we will not be getting rental income from those houses, although a developer could eventually. And then the last is we raised one out, out looking forward financial risk um, that was acknowledged, not for the project, but that the infrastructure, the streets, the sidewalks around the development are in very poor repair. Um, they present a safety concern and there will need, need to be investment. It's a state road, so we're hoping that we would gain state money similar to Pomeroy Lane, but right now that's an unfunded need of this project if we really want to densify and have more families walking in this area or biking, uh, they can't do so safely right now. So those were the three points I just wanted to highlight that are in the report. And again, this there was unanimous support of this, including our two resident non-voting members who both highly recommended the, the purchase. Is there any questions about the finance committee reports from the council? Seeing none, we're going to go Mandy Jo Haneke, please, CRC. Thank you. Um, I will make it brief. Kathy covered a whole lot of what uh, CRC also talks about. Uh, CRC voted unanimously to recommend the town council vote to acquire the property. Um, we, as the report says, it was very brief because the finance report is always very um, extensive. Um, we in CRC are aware that we need a lot of affordable housing and we need more affordable housing in this project um, and the acquisition of the property will do that um, or will lead us to being able to do that. And the location that is proposed for this is appropriate for housing of the size of proposed. It's proxim because of its proximity to the village center and an elementary school that has recreation available, playgrounds and all, and recreation, you know, sports fields, conservation and farming land that is being developed for community gardens and trail use, and a location on a busy street that is served by public transportation. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions, but I think Kathy covered the rest of it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Melissa, you have your hand up. Yeah, I I really appreciated the way that both of you delved into the, like what will this really look like for affordability, and so I understand that some of that is to be determined, and so I appreciate that you tried to tease that out a little bit that there's different possible options associated with that. And then the only thing I wanted to say about the finance committee report is it would be awesome to go ahead and include under the finance committee list of names the names of the people who are serving as non-voting members because you know they should get credit for that. <laughs> Thank you. Will do. We we'll agree, and we will do. Uh, any other comments from counselors or questions at this time? Okay, then I'm going to read the motion and look for a second. In accordance with Charter Section 5.6, having been published on the Town Bulletin Board for a minimum of 10 days on December 22nd, 2020. A public forum held on January 4th, 2021, and having been reviewed and recommended by the Finance Committee report of January 21st, 2021, as well as recommended by the Community Resources Committee report of January 21st, 2021, to adopt Council Order FY21 08A, an order appropriating authorizing debt and acquiring and disposing of three parcels for community housing purposes as presented. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Any other further questions at this time? Let me point out that the complete financial order is attached to your um, motion sheet for the evening. And it is a page and three fourths. So I'm not going to read it. Any further questions at this point? Hearing none, I'm going to move for the vote. Um, and in this case, I'm going to start with Darcy Dumont. 
Sorry. Yes. Lisa Marisa, aye. Hi, Haneke. Aye. Pam. Aye. Ross. Aye. Ryan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Driver. Aye. Steinberg. Aye. Schwartz. Aye. Tony Bonnell. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Matthew Andrew. Aye. It was unanimous, 13 in favor, none opposed, none ab abstaining, and no people absent. Thank you for all the hard work that has gone into moving us through this process, and we look forward to updates. We're going to move on to the Pomeroy Village Mass Works Grant. And this is the action we're going to take tonight is to refer this to the Town Services and Outreach Committee. So we don't have to make decisions tonight, but this is the more thorough, thorough presentation and will allow us as a council to identify things we wanna make sure that TSO pays attention to. I will also mention that if there are further issues that in, you know, relate to the larger community, um, it, there may need to be a later referral to CRC, and if there's any further financial issues, they would need to be referred to uh, finance committee. So um, with that, I'm going to call on, I think it's Paul, uh, Chris Brestrup and Gifford Morning and David. So we have slides to show. And while Sean's putting those up, we just um, have a presentation to you as an, our introduction to this um, project that we're hoping to be able to do in the very near future. Um, really proud of our team for securing a $1.5 million grant from the state to totally rehabilitate this, this in key intersection that Mr. Hayden referenced earlier today. Um, a, the grant uh, acquisition was a, was, a, was a teamwork between the planning department and the public works department. The public works doing the engineering, planning doing the planning part of it. Um, and it'll be, is a, is a project that's been on our list for a long time, as uh, Mr. Hayden said, and it'll be one that we'll be able to take off our list um, using state funds uh, for the big bulk of it. Um, your main decision for the council is what kind of intersection do you want? Do you want a roundabout or do you want a signalized intersection? And we want you to think about both of those. We want, we'll give you information on both options. And we want you to keep an open mind for both options because they're, they, each one has advantages and disadvantages. So we want to go through a pretty thorough process, engage the public in a pretty thorough way as well. Um, with your decision, we'll be able to move forward with our design and we'll go through all that later this today. So the presentation, we're gonna talk about the intersection, the challenges we face, some of the history for the, for the intersection, the finances and what we're suggesting for public engagement. So we can go to the next slide. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but then turn it over to Dave Zomack very quickly. Pomeroy Village, everyone knows, is the intersection of West Street and Pomeroy Lane and West Pomeroy Lane. It's what we have defined as a village center that has um, restaurants, retail stores, a service station, their offices, two preschool centers. There's an affordable housing cooperative, a planned subdivision not, not far away. Uh, there's apartments, condominiums, uh, office, office parks. Um, it's in within very uh, within two and a half miles. There are um, I lost the screen, but Sean. But within two and a half miles are um, the uh, the cultural district around Hampshire College plus the college itself. And also, it's it's with the uh, acquisition of Hickory Ridge, we will have um, uh, we hope to create some walking paths to access this area from the uh, apartment complexes on uh, East Hadley Road. And so that's, that's a very exciting opportunity. And this is all just coming together so wonderfully. It's just a real opportunity. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dave to keep us going. Sure, thank you, Paul. And thank you to the council for having us tonight. We're gonna to run through this slide deck um, fairly quickly because there's quite a few slides. We were, we were glad to be able to get this to you last week and, and we hope you had an opportunity to, to skim through it and see and share our excitement about uh, this incredible opportunity we have. And really, as Paul said, it's an opportunity uh, with this Mass Works grant to really 
re-envision what this intersection uh, can be. Um, and of course, one of the reasons that we were able to get the grant is there are some deficiencies in the intersection and we're gonna be honest about those as well. And we'll talk about those. Um, I was on the call, uh, the Zoom earlier and I did hear the chair of the TAC talk about some of the goals of the TAC and, and staff and, and I'm sure the council share those goals about making this a walkable, bikeable, livable, a more livable, more bikeable, more walkable uh, um, intersection and, and uh, village center. So next slide. So there are many challenges here. Um, I'm sure any of you and many of you who either live in South Amherst or, or recreate there or uh, eat or dine or, or spend time uh, down, down this way toward Hampshire College and, and uh, other parts south uh, understand that this, this intersection um, was designed a long time ago and there are a number of inefficiencies and, and uh, safety issues from poor pedestrian access and amenities. It is, as Aaron Hayden said, a very car-centered design. Um, but there is an opportunity there. Uh, there are a number of parcels that are available for development, but also a number of underdeveloped parcels that, that really could um, be redeveloped into something uh, that contributes more to the village center. Next slide. We want to make sure whenever we're doing planning work that we are following the master plan. And I know the, the council has spent a considerable amount of time in your first term talking about the master plan. And of course, um, in the planning department and uh, conservation department and all departments, we first looked at that plan to say what was called for and what were some of the goals and objectives outlined in the master plan. And clearly the Pomeroy Village Center was one of those uh, those areas of focus. And that's one of the reasons why we applied for the grant. So it's identified as a priority area for development um, and it can add to our tax base, increased housing, there's potential for affordable housing and a lot of other uh, amenities. Next slide. So as Paul said, we were successful in getting a $1.5 million grant, a highly competitive state process uh, 1.5 million, uh, we all, that's a, that's a wonderful number. I remember when we got the uh, grant for the Triangle Street intersection, we thought, you know, uh, we, were, we were very thankful for that state support. But 1.5 million doesn't go as far as it used to. So we need to be careful. Uh, we, we clearly want to aim high and we want to, we have aspirations for how, how, we, uh, how nice, how aesthetically pleasing, how safe this intersection could be. Uh, working with Mr. Mooring, who, you know, that is his specialty with his engineering staff. Um, we need to keep it within budget as well. We don't have unlimited funds down in, uh, to, to redo this intersection. So the focus will be on traffic, uh, bicycle and pedestrian safety. Um, and we look for a collaboration between departments, but also a collaboration with the neighborhood, with property owners, with business owners, and people who live in the village center and in the neighborhood surrounding the village center. Next slide. As Paul mentioned, uh, we think this, this uh, investment from the state leverages significant uh, opportunities. Uh, we're, we're continuing to work on the acquisition of the Hickory Ridge Golf Course. And as Paul mentioned, uh, a number of opportunities could present themselves there with uh, connections to other uh, um, uh, housing developments and, and neighborhoods. Um, and the opportunity to spur private uh, reinvestment in this um, village center. And, and we, we, we need to keep that front and center. Uh, there is undeveloped land in the village center and we hope that uh, some of the owners of that land will be as excited as we are about what, what's coming uh, in the next couple of years. Next slide. Turn it over to Chris Brestrup. I am Chris Brestrup, planning director. Um, I'm, I'm going to cough. I can't believe it. This is a map from about 1830 showing the intersection of Pomeroy Lane and West Street. We also know it as 116. Um, before Pomeroy Lane, only the east-west roadway in South Amherst was Bay Road. The only east-west roadway was Bay Road, which you can see at the bottom of the slide here. This picture shows a building that was there around that time. This building was built in 1825. It's called the Aaron Merrick House. And it's the um, one of the earliest brick buildings built in Amherst. 
<coughs> in the 1950s and 60s, the intersection was essentially a crossroads. The gas station, small convenience store were built there. And over the years, the village center grew up. Next slide, please. The project is located um, along a critical north-south transportation route, Route 116, that links important sites in Amherst with South Hadley, Granby, and points south. Um, we also have Pomeroy Lane, which is, is our east-west link, um, and it links South Amherst Common, where the Munson Library is, with Hadley and points west. Next slide, please. The area around the intersection is a mixed use area and can contain subdivisions of single family homes, as well as apartment complexes along East Hadley Road and the apartment complex of Pomeroy Court. The area also includes office buildings like Amherst Office Park owned by Ron Laverdier and the two buildings owned by the Slobody Development Corporation. It's a high traffic intersection, especially during commuter hours. Next slide, please. The site is located close to the Hickory Ridge Golf Course, which is soon to be purchased by the town. You can see that as a big white area to the uh, left. Um, it is also located near a high concentration of apartment complexes on East Hadley Road. And this area is considered to be an environmental justice area, meaning that there's a large population of people of various ethnic backgrounds, many with low incomes, who need to be included in the public process. Next slide, please. I'm going to show you an aerial view showing some of the more prominent land uses. Office buildings at the South Town Commons, Amherst Office Park, the Speedway Gas Station and Convenience Store, Jehovah's Witnesses Kingdom Hall, the Montessori School and Mission Cantina and other businesses. And then the next slide, please. The next slide shows uh, areas of housing in the area. Um, yes, uh, and gives you a sense of how many apartment units there are in any given uh, building. Next slide, please. In the 1990s, the state developed a plan for West Street and Route 116, including the Pomeroy Lane intersection. But the town thought that the plan was overblown and overdeveloped, and the town decided to take over the road so that it would have more control over what happened there. So the town now owns the whole of this road going all the way, starting at Amherst College at the top of the hill, all the way down to Country Corners Road in South Amherst, just south of Atkins uh, Market, um, and which is just north of the Notch. So the town has control over this road. It's not a state highway anymore. In 2004, traffic signals were installed by the town as an alternative to um, this design that the state developed. And then in 2008, 2009, a little short while after I started working in town hall, the planning department and the DPW um, put together a design, a design plan for the intersection. And as part of the process, there was a lot of public process, including public meetings and surveys. Then in 2013, the town applied for a mass works grant for this design, but we were unsuccessful at that time. But this year we were successful and we're so happy about that. In 2020, we received $1.5 million to improve the intersection. Next slide, please. I think the next slide has a list of deficiencies. We've already talked about some of these things, but it's really lack of pedestrian accessibility, lack of sidewalks, um, no bike lanes. There's a lot of queuing going south in the afternoon. Next slide, please. The next slides are visions or views of what this intersection looks like right now. Here we are looking north toward the Speedway gas station. And the next slide, please, is looking east. You can see um, the office building on the right and just beyond that is the Kingdom Hall and the Montessori School. Now, um, next slide, please. Now we're looking south um, towards um, towards the notch. Next slide, please. And now we are looking west. Um, so if you kept going through the intersection, you would be uh, heading towards Hadley. Next slide, please. Um, hmm, I think 
During the early stages of work on this project, the town council will need to decide if the town wants an enhanced signalized intersection or a roundabout. And um, we'll be talking to you about that more in the future. And now I'd like to turn it over to Guilford Mori, Superintendent of Public Works. Is Guilford there? We don't hear you, Guilford. Guilford's muted. He's not, he's not oh. muted. Or, uh, he's going to come back in. Okay. okay. We had a little connection problem, so he's re entering. So I think, as you can tell, we're really excited about this project. Um, and uh, it's, it's a good thing because we're not using town funds other than matching our, our staff's work with it. So, um, but there's some, this decision for you is gonna be a, a big one for you, I think. Um, I, may I just say that it's clear that this project didn't come out of nowhere, that it's been around since the 1990s. So we're finally getting around to doing it. And I'm really glad about that. Well, we're waiting for Guilford. Could somebody describe what an enhanced signalized intersection is? It simply means better, better signals than there are there now. So there'll be probably smart lights and things like that. Okay. Um, is Guilford back in yet, Athena? Yes, he's here. He's here. We just can't hear him. You need to talk about it? Can't get Guilford. No, we're not hearing you, Guilford. So maybe we should just move on. Yes, I think you need to talk. So the, um, can, can you uh, show us the next slide, please? Here's the enhanced um, intersection that we designed back in 2008, 2009, and it's had improvements to it since. So it's showing you a crossed intersection, essentially what exists there now with added turning lanes, northbound and southbound, also added bike lanes and um, new signals, as, as Mr. Bockelman said, and crosswalks and curb ramps in all directions. Next slide, please. The next slide shows you um, the roundabout design. Um, and what that would be is um, there wouldn't be any um, signals. Um, you would have a roundabout probably similar to the one at um, Triangle Street and East Pleasant Street, roughly that size. Um, and you would have all the amenities of added bike lanes, um, pedestrian access and crosswalks and curb ramps and significant traffic calming. Next slide, please. So some of the things that the town council will need to consider when it's deciding uh, which um, design to approve would be um, its impact on commercial businesses, bicycle and pedestrian access and safety, accommodations for buses, ADA considerations, um, meaning uh, considerations for handicapped accessibility, um, placemaking benefits. How do you create a, a village center here? That's the village center has been developing slowly, but we don't want to do anything that would um, kind of put it off track. And then cost comparisons, which, um, which design can be done for the amount of money that we have. The traffic volume, and we're going to um, be working with an engineer to, to figure that out. And then safety features. Um, next slide, please. In terms of finances, the estimated total project cost is about 1.658 million. Um, we have a mass works grant for 1.5 million and the town match is going to be staff time, engineering, planning and oversight, et cetera. Next slide, please. We wanted to talk to you about the public engagement process. So um, 
both the town staff and town council will be engaged in the public engagement process. Town staff will be working on meeting with abutting property owners, meeting, and we've already started that to some degree, meeting with commercial and business operators, uh, focusing on neighborhood meetings, Orchard Valley, Carriage Lane, East Hadley Road, et cetera. Um, enhanced interactive website project webpage. So that means that we will be displaying information about this project as it moves along and giving people an opportunity to comment on it. And the town council will be holding council committee meetings. Um, I understand that there are two open public meetings required for this project. And you will also be soliciting written public comment. Next slide, please. This gives you an outline of what the timeline is for the public engagement process. We've already be begun, we're having this staff presentation tonight. Um, so in January and February, the town council will dis be discussing, discussing what the public engagement process for this project should be, and then referring this project to the appropriate council committee. In March and April, there'll be outreach to um, individual neighbors and business operators and landowners and then the two council committee sponsored public meetings. In April, May, and June, the council committee review and recommendation will occur with a report to town council. And town council will be making um, a choice about which design for the intersection it wishes to go with. And that would happen probably sometime in May or June. It really needs to happen by June. Next slide, please. So the overall project timeline, um, again, we're starting in June of 2021. That's when we receive the money from the state. Um, we'll begin design and uh, surveying and engineering at that time. And that will go on until uh, approximately December of 2021. Then in January of 2022, we'd be advertising bids and opening bids in February. The contract would be awarded in February if everything goes well and construction would start in March of 2022. So that's March of next year. And then um, construction, we hope, will be complete in May of 2023. And that bottom item punch list, what that means is that the project is essentially complete. There may just be a few things that need to be finished, like raising catch basin lids and things like that. Um, so with that, I think we are um, finished with our, our program and we welcome your questions. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Um, would, uh, Sean, would you please take the thing down and also put the clock up for comments, okay? Uh, I'm going to call on, as soon as the clock comes up, I'm calling on Kathy Shane, but hold on. Here we go, Kathy. Okay, I'm on the timer. Okay, I, I have, um, I have a, a list of comments slash questions, and I, I don't think I need to get uh, answers to them right now. It's just for things that we need to be thinking about. One, um, the speed limit on the north-south road, that's a state road. Um, can we, will we try to get it lowered well before the intersection? So drop it down to 25 miles an hour, quite a distance away as part of traffic slowing. Second, um, bus stops, where are they now? Um, where would they be? That was already mentioned in one of it. Um, the sidewalks, the third, is how far will I'll the- raise my hand. How far oh. will the sidewalk extend um, along Pomeroy? Can, do we have enough money to extend it up to Hickory Ridge? So if we get a development up there, will you be able to walk along a sidewalk there where there isn't one now? Um, I'm assuming, because one of the diagrams showed it, that if you had signalized there's enough money to um, repair the road and widen it to allow uh, turning lanes. Um, smart lights have already been mentioned, but they are pretty useful for slowing traffic and allowing turning safely. And then um, one of the, I've been doing work on, because roundabouts were discussed up in North Amherst on trying to gather information on them. And one of the advice on them is if you're talking about higher density, is that's your goal? And you've got little kids, inexperienced bikers, 
crossing intersections and ADA kinds of concerns. You're better with signalized intersection for pedestrian safety. It may improve car safety, but um, one pointed out that one accident with a bike or pedestrian is it tends to be pretty serious. So, um, so I so that's just a, a thinking of where we're going with this. Whatever the traffic volume is now, if we densify this, the traffic volume will be higher than it is now. I mean, that's part of the design of what we're doing in here. And it's been pointed out there's preschool and little kids around here. So it's not just the disabled, but inexperienced uh, walkers as pedestrians. I think I am out of my time. So those are my seven points about thinking about where we're going. Thank you, Dorothy, Pam, please, first of all, reset the clock, Sean. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay, well, this sounds very exciting. I have just two questions. Um, to widen the road to allow for uh, wide sidewalks and bike lanes, does the town already own that right of way or will you have to buy it from people and how does that impact the situation? And then I guess I kind of, it's gonna take 14 months to build, which may in fact in intersection life not be a long time, I don't know but um, how much business disruption will there be during that time? And are there any plans to uh, keep it, to reduce it somehow? And that's my questions. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna pause for a moment and just ask Chris and David if there's any response to any of the questions. For example, the issue of owning land. That would be a Guilford question. Guilford? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. I love my computer. <laughs> um, one of the things we have to do in the design process is actually do a survey of the properties. If you look at the drawings that show both the signalized intersection and the roundabout, those are based on just the GIS lines we have. And there is some, there is some doubt as to what we do own for right away in that area. So there is going to be no matter which no matter which choice we take, there will be some land takings that have to um, take place between now and construction. Okay. I think the other questions are really part of the design as we go along. I don't think they require answers tonight. Um, um, could, I just, could I answer one of them? Because sure. I think it's pretty definitive. The budget does not include a sidewalk to Hickory Ridge. Um, that is a very significant additional cost and a permitting challenge given that there's a a uh, perennial stream that goes in wetland area um, along West Bummer Lane. So I just wanted to create realistic expectations that this will not connect by sidewalk to West Bummer. We're still looking at village center connections that might happen in other ways. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pat DeAngelis, we'll start the clock for you. Uh, I'm very familiar with this intersection because I lived at the Pomeroy Lane Cooperative for the first five years that I lived in Amherst. Um, and I'm not going to uh, recite um, the issues about uh, ADA uh, needs uh, or children uh, because they've been brought up eloquently by My Myra Ross and also talked about by Kathy. But I do want, when I'm looking at the list of who's going to be reached out to, uh, abutters, uh, owner, business owners, et cetera, et cetera. And as liaison for the Disability Access Advisory Committee, I'm really um, coming off of a meeting where they were quite upset that they had not been contacted uh, about this. And there, the triangle roundabout really does not work for anyone with any kind of um, disability or impairment. Um, so I guess my question, and I'm running out of time, gosh, um, my question is why isn't the Disability Access Advisory Committee automatically uh, uh, reached out to uh, whenever any of these projects happen? Um, and they are a committee of the town. They work very hard. They are people, many of them, not all, uh, are differently abled and they have uh, um, a perspective that this town needs on many levels. Uh, I'll take that one. Please go ahead, 
we, we don't have all the information they're going to ask questions about. We don't even have all the information you're asking questions about. To take a project and automatically rule something out before you have gathered all the information you can to decide what are the pros and cons of which way you want to go is really a disservice to everyone, including those with disabilities. The goal should always be to look at all the options. And one of the things I was going to talk about is really there's four options for this intersection right now. Option one is to leave it the way it is if we actually decide that we can live with the lights it is and just make a few improvements. Option two is to go to the fully, fully designed intersection, which is what Mass Highway proposed and no one really wanted at the time, including a lot of the people on the Disabilities Access Committee because the time period to walk across the intersection was so large and it was so great, they didn't really want to have things like that. And that's one of the reasons why the town took the intersection over. Um, do we need turn lanes now? The design you saw was based on data from 2000, 2001 and 2000, 2000 and 2001. We're now almost 20 years away from there. Is, are there different things we need to look at and the data needs to be different? Before you go and talk to a committee, you need to have some of the answers of what their questions are going to be. And that's really what we're trying to do here and to gather. So I, I really, it's not that we leave them out. It's we don't have information to talk to them about. Sometimes I think though, Guilford, that you need their questions to stimulate your thinking. And so going to them much sooner than you're saying, I think would be very helpful. All right, um, Shalini Balmilm, let's put the clock up. All right, here it goes. Uh, cost of maintenance, so that could be another consideration as we are um, th deciding um, the variables. We had a great district meeting. I would encourage you all to use the chat. We sent you the copy of the chat because we made a summary of all the input that we got from the residents there. Um, pros and cons of the roundabouts that, and I suppose you're gonna tell us that at some later point. Uh, just for the council members, uh, I received this from uh, an urban planner, and this was also brought up in a district meeting. Uh, one of the urban planners from UMass, I think spoke in favor of the roundabouts, which was very uh, interesting for me because most of the residents, including me, were like, no, no, we don't want roundabouts because we want it to be people-centered and be more user-friendly and all of that and build community and all of that. But I got this from uh, somebody, uh, it's called Public Square. It's a publication with best practices. And it actually says that unlike the big, fast, scary, dangerous road traffic circles, uh, when they're designed properly, they can actually be great for placemaking and they said, design properly roundabouts, enhance placemaking, pedestrian experience, and they're a gift to landscape architects and whatnot. So I'd be really curious to hear, how, you know, what is proposed over here? And then in Triangle Street, do we have like the yield signs? Because, or I mean, what is it about the Triangle Street that does not make it work for people with disabilities? And why are people, you know, and what is the difference going to, I mean, do we have all the things in place that, could make a roundabout a really good people-centered. Is that possible? And what are we not doing correctly? What are we envisioning here? Um, list of stakeholders. What I'm hearing is that it would be really great to see that on the website, that these are the different people, including uh, the Committee for Disabilities, like the different stakeholders that are being reached out to and at what point they will be reached out to maybe or something so that people know that and I do appreciate the idea of going to them early on to even understand what to bring that lens to the whole problem, you know, like what to be looking out for. Is my timer? Can I still go on, keep talking? Um, Anything else? Pomeroy plan. There was a plan uh, done long ago in 2008 or 2009, and I've been trying to find that. Is it possible to for all of us to see? Because that, I believe, had a lot of public. Uh, community engagement in it. Oh, and then bus stops. Um, I don't think we have bus stops there and benches. And do we have money for beautification around it? Okay. Oh, signage and signage <laughs> to make it accessible. And yeah. Okay. Time's up. <laughs> Darcy? 
Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm uh, excited to see the work to be done um, at Pomeroy Village and that the grant will pay for almost the entire project. I, I was involved in um, putting out some ideas way back when it was, uh, when the master plan was being looked at for Pomeroy Village. Um, my, my greatest hope would be that as a fully realized village center, it could have an anchor business located there. Um, and my real dream is that the Amherst Food Co-op be, be located there. Um, so I would agree that we should outreach to relevant town committees, uh, just as a matter of course on these projects, including the Disability Access Committee, TAC, and the ECAC. All of them would uh, potentially have thoughts or recommendations. Um, and also, I am interested to know more about the value of roundabouts. Um, I've, I, you know, I've Googled them and learned quite a bit more about them since our District 5 meeting uh, that we had that Aaron mentioned. Um, and I guess the question is, um, how much safety it provides, because that seems to be its main value. Uh, I was concerned at the, the public comment today about um, the problems that visually impaired people might have with uh, a roundabout. So I, I want to know about that. Um, and I, I, um, um, I just want to know whether the additional safety provided is um, it makes it worth having more so than what the amenities we could have if we didn't spend all of our money on the roundabout. So um, uh, just, you know, want us to be looking into all of those details about and not just assume that we're going to do it. I think it seems weird to a lot of normal people to have a roundabout when you only have an intersection of two streets. Um, uh, that seems odd to me too. <laughs> um, so I think it just needs to be explained more, the, the merits, the value of a roundabout. I'm gonna pause and ask Christine Brestrup who has her hand up if she'd like to comment. I wanted to say two things. I think one of the counselors mentioned the fact that they thought that the roadway was still owned by the state and it, it's not owned by the state from the center of Amherst all the way down to Country Corners Road, which is almost at the notch. It's owned by the town. So we make the decisions about what's going to happen there, even though we're using state money. And the other thing I wanted to say is the old design. Uh, one of the counselors asked to see the old design and it is a good design, but it's um, more expensive than what we're currently able to build. I think it's quite a lot more expensive. It went farther in all four directions than the current um, thought is to go. So I don't think we're gonna be able to build the old design and um, Guilford probably has it somewhere in his files, but I'm not sure that that's a, a good, uh, a road that we wanna go down, so to speak. <laughs> okay. No pun intended, right? Um, Stephen Schreiber. Hi. So, um, what was it, 10 years ago, Amherst had no experience with roundabouts. And now I was trying to count. We have five, including the new one built at UMass. So it's in somewhere around five. And I remember when the first one was built um, on the north side of the UMass campus, there was some discussion that the world was going to end. And then when the double rotary was built closer to Atkins, the world was surely going to end. But the, the um, apocalypse is going to be the triangle rotary. So, which is, and uh, that's the, the triangle rotary, I'm sorry, roundabout, is one that I go through multiple times per day on my bike, on foot. And it has be, made that intersection ex exceptionally safer and more effective. So I hope by now the fears of um, roundup rotaries has dissipated and the, the benefits of rotaries, especially if you've lived here during the construction of all of these, 
is, the benefits are enormous. So I think that what, counts, what Myra Ross said earlier, that needs to be looked at. I'm not um, seeing impaired, uh, but, I do, but I go through that intersection with lots of other people you know, every day, but I think that um, how one deals with those issues needs to be addressed. I bicycle through those intersections all the time. It's um, much safer than it was going through a signalized intersection. So all of this is anecdotal. So I'm telling my story, others are telling their stories. I think we need to have a more empirical, you know, look at the, the benefits. So uh, anyway, I think that wherever a roundabout can be built, it should be built because it just, it keeps idling traffic. It just seems like a much more efficient way, even with a modern smart signalized system. It just seems like a more efficient way to keep all movement going, pedestrians, bicycles, and cars. The other thing I thought, I say 55 seconds. The other thing I thought about Triangle is that it was going to kill the prospect of development on those underdeveloped lots right on that, you know, where the Bank of America building is. Nothing has happened there, but but that fear that everyone would be so worried about the, the um, roundabout that no one would ever want to you know, visit those sites has not happened. So it's not like the Bourne Rotary, right? Or the Fresh Pond Rotaries. These are you know, much calmer than the ones that we might be used to in urban areas. Thank you. I yield my 20 seconds to whomever. And yeah, we don't do yields. Uh, <laughs> Evan Ross. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So um, one of the slides in the presentation that I thought was really great, I think uh, Chris presented it, was the town council considerations that listed sort of all of the different things you have to consider, um, which is great I, I, because some of those maybe I wouldn't have thought of off the top of my head and it gives us a framework. Um, I wanted to just add one, um, which is um, based on a lot of the focus of the council over the past two years. Um, climate mitigation and resilience. I think that's also an important lens to look at this through. Um, years ago, I went through a, um, down or down a weird rabbit hole of looking at research papers on uh, emissions reductions from roundabouts. And there's a lot of research out there about how because they reduce idling, um, they reduce fuel consumption and, and can actually pretty substantially reduce uh, transportation emissions. And then of course, because you've removed the lights, you remove the safety hazard of what happens when a big storm comes through um, and wipes out power. And so there's a lot of climate research out there about why roundabouts are actually the better system for mitigation and resilience. And so I think as we're developing our um, climate action plan and our goals, that should always be a lens that we look through any infrastructure um, uh, project with. And I think with this one, there's actually research out there that's relevant to the decision we're making. So I'm hoping we can just add that as a consideration to that long list of other very important considerations. Thank you. Melissa? Well, that's a great segue because while we're adding things, I don't think that any of us have a shared sense of what an environmental justice neighborhood is. This is a new term to Amherst. We've not been using this term at the town council in prior times, and certainly the entire community is not familiar with it. So when we when we have a slide that says Pomeroy Village Center Town Council Considerations, and we've mentioned twice that it's environmental justice neighborhood, and we say nothing about environmental justice on that slide, then we have a problem. And so we need to figure out how to start talking about that in ways that our larger community understands. ECAC probably understands it completely, but the larger community and I believe the shared town council does not. In terms of the roundabouts, um, in pushing back on the, and as Steve said, you know, it's all each our anecdotal experience, anecdata like we like so much, is to say that a roundabout doesn't make sense for two streets is absolutely false in my reality. I live just north of the first roundabout, which is the one at north of campus, and it was two streets that were brought together, basically, and it makes perfect sense, as does the slightly odd but 
now getting used to it, new one at Fearing and University. So it doesn't have to be something that's three or four or five streets coming together in an anti goggling way. But following up on that, I was really concerned about what Myra Ross shared earlier tonight about the triangle roundabout being unacceptable to people with certain disabilities. This is news to those of us who supported the triangle roundabout. Yes, we heard that the world was going to end and then the world didn't end, but apparently there are still issues that need to be addressed. So I'm all in support of figuring out ways to both mitigate that at triangle and to figure out how not to have that problem moving forward. And then in terms of the outreach and the DAAC, it does very clearly state in the slides that the town staff is going to be meeting with abutting property owners, meeting with commercial and business operators, focused neighborhood meetings. Um, and so just add DAAC there. That's where it belongs, as does TAC and possibly ECAC as well, because I don't think it's suddenly becomes TSO's job to go to those committees instead of staff when staff's meeting with all those other people in conjunction with committee members. So I think that's one of the ways we start getting used to including DAC, TAC, and ECAC where they belong in these processes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andy. Yeah, and I'm kind of following up on Alyssa. Alyssa and I were on the select board when we went through the pros and cons and ultimately took the vote on the Triangle Street uh, roundabout. And um, as the liaison to DAAC for the select board, I can assure you that uh, DAAC was very involved. Um, saying that, um, and to follow up on one point Alyssa made, uh, Ms. Ross was not a member of DAAC at the time, and there was nobody with a sight impairment who was a member of DAAC at that time. So that um, it is a uh, perspective that was not heard. I have talked with Myra since the uh, completion of the uh, uh, roundabout. Um, so I've had shared, um, I, I, I've heard her statements to me directly. Um, the things that, uh, we heard and know is that um, for most people crossing the intersection, it's actually much safer than a long intersection with a uh, where the crosswalk is very long because the length of time and length of distance between each point where you're in a safe zone as a pedestrian and uh, either on the island or the sidewalk in the next point is much shorter than crossing an entire intersection. And traffic tends to speed up as lights turn yellow, as opposed to slow down. Roundabouts are in fact traffic calming devices in and of themselves if they're constructed properly. And that was very much a part of the discussion in the design of the Triangle Street um, intersection. Uh, the other oddities of Triangle Street to just complete uh, sharing our experience from the prior time was that to do a signalized intersection there would have taken um, a lot of land from Kendrick Park which we determined was a inappropriate use of the park that had been gifted to the town as a park and um, there's also the oddity of the fact that it wasn't a cross intersection, it was an X intersection and people coming from the university and trying to make a left turn into North Pleasant Street to go up towards Cushman and North Amherst uh, by uh, going up East Pleasant Street were, uh, that was a very difficult and dangerous turn to make. So those were all factors that we considered. They were unique to the intersection and um, this is a unique intersection of itself. And therefore we're gonna to have to go through a similar process now. Great, thank you. Um, is, uh, Sarah, I saw your hand up, but you've taken it down. I'm just wondering if my question might be addressed later, but I'm wondering uh, when you put in a roundabout, how close the new roundabout can be to an existing building, either a business or a home. And um, I mean, obviously we would see when, when things were drawn up, but just how that would then um, affect, I guess, noise as far as if there was a home or a restaurant and also um, existing parking lots and how um, some of those businesses come together how um, 
then just because of the, the closeness, how egresses would work, but that's, I'm sure that's sort of down the line. Okay. Are there any other comments from counselors at this time? And let me just say before we uh, make the motion that obviously uh, TSO will need to coordinate with the council in terms of agenda and setting of these meeting dates and so forth. And some of them might be done during TSO meetings or separate, but not necessarily part of council meetings, but I will work with the chair of TSO to do that. So with that, the motion is as follows. Uh, to refer the Pomeroy Village Mass Works Grant Project to the Town Services and Outreach Committee for review and recommendation on the choice of intersection design and to guide public engagement with report back to the Town Council by May 3rd, 2021. Is there a second? I second it. Thank you, Darcy. Any further questions or comments? Then we'll begin the vote and we begin with Griesmer and it's an aye. Uh, Mandy Jo. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Aye. Mandy Steinberg. Aye. Peter Schwartz. Aye. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Lisa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. And Dorothy DeMott. Yes. 13 zero, zero, zero. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for that very thorough presentation. Clearly, this is not the last we've heard of this one. Okay, we are going to go back and do the proclamation. And in this case, I did not put this on the consent agenda because it had been indicated to me that there might need to be additional discussion. Uh, the proclamation uh, did go to GOL and I'm going to ask George to make the report on that. Yes, Lynn, um, this came to GOL on January 20. Um, and uh, we discussed it and reviewed it, and it was voted 5-0 um, to be deemed clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay. Um, are there council questions on the proclamation? Yes, Bandy Joe. Well, I don't have a question, but I'd like to speak as one of the co-sponsors. Yes, I'm sorry. I should have recognized both of you as co-sponsors. Mandy Joe Haneke and... Um, Pat DeAngelis are the co-sponsors of this and the authors of it. So please speak to it. Thank you. Um, you know, I, in my two years as a counselor, I have become increasingly aware that it's our duty as elected officials to call out injustices, even if they don't occur in our town. And so when I saw what happened on January 6th and how detrimental to our democracy it is and what happened is, um, it decided we needed to say something. And so, um, and then we received a request from Defund 413 to do something similarly. Um, so I reached out to Pat and said, would you help me and co-sponsor something? And so we drafted this. And one of the things I was thinking of beyond the fact that I believe we increasingly, I believe we have these duties to talk about things like this and condemn them when they happen, is that back in the summer, after the murder of George Floyd, our town manager, our chief of the school, superintendent of the schools, but also our chief of police came out and condemned the actions of the police officer, um, the police officers and um, spoke out against what happened in the murder of Mr. Floyd. Yet in the aftermath of this one, we heard from the town manager and we heard from the superintendent but we did not hear from the chief of police. And while this resolution um, and, you know, does not come out and specifically ask for something from the chief, because we as a town council specifically cannot do that under our charter. I mean, it's one of the reasons things were changed in the draft from what came out of GOL. I was deeply disappointed that the chief didn't speak out condemning the insurrection or the actions of the insurrectionists or the disparate public safety responses between that day and the Black Lives Matters peaceful protests that occurred after the murder of George Floyd. Because if we are going to become an anti-racist town, 
both us as elected officials, but also our leaders, our town manager, our public safety officials, our other department heads need to be held to higher standards and condemn things like this when they happen, especially when they have racist overtones um, and white supremacist overtones with the, which the actions of January 6th did. So I just thought I had to say that. Um, I hope this council will unanimously support this resolution. Um, I am still conflicted about not, um, about removal of one section that I know the defund 413 um, supporters would like to see in it. Um, but I do think you know, that's something that we might not be able to do as a council. And so I'm not going to not support this because of that, but I did feel like I had to say what I just said. Thank you. Pat, you're also a co-sponsor. Do you have any comment at this time? Um, a, a very personal one to Mandy Jo, uh, because just a few months ago or a few weeks ago, uh, COVID time is very bizarre. You said you weren't very much a so, of a social justice person, an activist, a social activist. And I'm very proud of your growth and um, my own uh, in collaborating with you. And um, I am also hoping that the council can see the importance of this proclamation. And I second Mandy Joe's request uh, or question about why our chief of police has not spoken out. Alyssa. I'm very sorry if I missed this part of, of the very effective um, discussion we've been having so far, but did we ask him why he hasn't done so? I, I mean, I'm not trying to be provocative here. I'm just, I understand that there are lines of authority that we try not to cross, but has there been any discussion with him as to why that gap has occurred? I would call on to, uh, town manager Bachman. Yeah, so when we drafted, uh, to be honest, this was this uh, our first uh, pro uh, statement was done very quickly on the weekend or, or that instantaneously. We tried to get it out right away because we were mostly thinking about children being harmed by the by seeing the violence. And that was the focus was on our statement was in jointly with the um, the school department and look at that as the lens. Uh, I did not invite the, the police chief in. He would have, I'm sure he would have, just like with the George Floyd thing, he would have stepped out in instantaneously. I know, I think he would have done that. And I, I think, I feel like it's it's a little bit unfair to him to disparage him for not speaking out. Um, because, and it'd be a, more on me, I think, because I didn't invite him to join in a statement and probably in retrospect, I should have. But at that moment, our focus was on thinking about what this, how this was um, so disconcerting to children, and to other, not just children, but to people, people who who are immigrants and uh, to the country and who have experienced this in their own own lands. So, um, and it seemed to me that at that moment it was important to hear from the school superintendent, the town manager, and not necessarily the police chief in that moment. And you know, with the you know the perspective of an, of a couple weeks, I think, oh, maybe we should have at that moment. But at that moment, it didn't. You know, it, it, it was just like that didn't seem the right person to be standing up and saying something at that moment. That was my my judgment. So I take responsibility for that. Shalini, you have your hand up. Um, I also would like a clarification of why we're not in, why GOL did not include the um, the statement from defund about ensuring that no Amherstown employee who has sworn to uphold. Um, and why is it that we can't, is that, be, I mean, I understand kind of that it's not in our authority to, is that what the reasoning is? I'm going to actually go again back to Mr. Balkman, although in mm -hmm. your hand up as well. And I think you probably want to speak to that. Yeah, I can state unequivocally that no Amherst police officers participated, traveled, or took part in the Capitol riots. Mm -hmm. um, we, there are provisions in our rules and regulations and policies and procedures that officers must report any invest, investigations, arrests, or anything where they become uh, a plaintiff in a, in a situation like that. So if they are named, uh, they have to report that under our rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. um, there are, um, you know, there will be, um, we have not asked every, every officer 
but this is mm -hmm. it's spoken in confidence from the um, the chief of police. Um, you know, I think there are some um, free speech issues that I worry about, and also collective bargaining issues I worry about. But mostly free speech issues. If if just traveling to a location, um, what does that mean? Um, it it I think that that opens up a real different animal that we're talking about. If someone is, has been, if they're part of the insurrection, then that's, that's, that's cause for investigation for us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I think, that's where I am on this. Is, can I? Yes, go ahead, Shalini. Uh, I did, I'm not feeling like we've come to a resolution around, I mean, is it worth, I mean, we can authorize that, but could, could you ask the police to uh, chief to come up with a statement and not about the travel part, but at least stating that uh, no one took part in the actual, whatever that word is, insurrection. I don't know that word, but, but it feels like we, we need to, it's not, it's not feeling resolved to me that we can ask for it. And then I understand the free speech. So keep the free speech part where people can travel. So let's not do that. But at least the part that we are, because I think it's not, I mean, I don't believe, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty confident that no one did from our town do that. However, I think just making these statements is more about us reinforcing the, the you know, what we believe in and our values. It's an opportunity to speak up and say, okay, this is where we stand on these issues, even though if it's redundant or whatever. So it seems like it would be important to, have some sort of a statement, even if it's not part of the council. Did you want to speak further to that, Mr. Bachman? Yeah. Um, I don't have a good answer, uh, response at this moment. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think it's something to think about. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Andy, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, be real quick about it. Uh, I raised the issue um, at the GOL meeting because the charter is very clear about the town manager's responsibility for providing all supervision of employees and administering um, the collective bargaining agreements. And we're talking about people who are part of collective bargaining. And uh, it is not something that is specified as a council responsibility, um, nor are we empowered to make that, uh, to, to request information along those lines as, uh, as in the charter. And what I said at the GOL meeting is that I felt very uncomfortable um, with the idea that it would be an actionable item unless we had uh, opinion from um, the town attorney that it was an appropriate um, step to take under the council, um, under our charter rather. And uh, I just didn't feel that it was worth uh, taking the time to hold up this particular um, action in order to get um, a town attorney opinion on a very narrow, but a very important point. And that the easier thing to do would be to um, make the amendment that was made. Uh, Sean, we are supposed to be using the clock on these as well. Alyssa. Yeah, so following up on that concept from the charter, one of the, the areas I struggle with in the charter is section 2.8, investigations and access to information, because this was a non, this was not a part of the old town government act. And there's a section about investigations and then information requests and then town manager. And so the part under town manager says it's specific information to it on any matter within the jurisdiction of the town council. So I totally get that that's not the police force, right? They're not under our jurisdiction. But then why are there the first two parts talking about investigations, investigating the affairs of the town and the conduct or performance of any town agency and then information requests for multiple member bodies. I, I don't, I don't grasp the difference there. So maybe that is a future town attorney concept. 
Whenever we come to issues of the charter, I always look at Mandy Joe and say, do you want to comment? <laughs> it could take us hours, so I don't think it needs to be dealt with tonight. Okay. All right. Um, are there any further questions? All right. Then uh, the motion for the proclamation is as follows. Um, motion to adopt the resolution condemning the January 6, 2021 insurrection and violence at the U.S. Capitol as presented. Is there a second? Yeah, key seconds. Thank you. Um, and we're going to move immediately to a vote, starting with Mandy Jo. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Kevin Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Aye. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Uh, Shelley Bonnell. Yes. Melissa Burrow. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy DeMont. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. That's 13 0 0 0. We are going to move on to the town manager's goals. And let me um, preface this by saying we started out with one um, request for a change that is involved with the town manager's goals. And that's the one that was relevant to the presentation tonight, which was the public safety presentation, Public Safety Working Group Committee. So I'm gonna ask that we deal with that one and see if we have the ability to vote on the changes as requested in that motion. There are two others that have then been brought forward. One deals with housing and specifically with the um, adding to the town manager's goals, the exploration of a, a permanent either seasonal and or full time a year round shelter for the homeless. And then the third, that is a motion that got added in, uh, really updates the racial equity and social justice um, goal as it stands. My opinion as your president is that these other two should be referred to GOL because they could tie us up in knots for hours and I'm trying to shorten our meetings. So I'm gonna go back to the first goal. The first goal is the public safety goal. And I'm going to read the motion uh, that we amended by the way, since the original um, thing. And that is to amend the town council performance goals for the town manager, July 1, 2020 to June 30, 2021, adopted September 4th, 2020, by changing under policy goals, section two, community health and safety, the dates, results are, pre are presented to the town council from January 31st, to th January 31st, 2020 to January 31st, 2020. If we do that, the amendment would read that the approval of the 20 FY21 operating budget is made with the explicit understanding with the town manager that two upcoming anticipated vacancy, vacant positions in the police department's budget not be filled until the town manager in consultation with the town council and residents of Amherst has fully explored alternative options of providing services and presented the results to the town council no later than March 31st, 2021. Pat. I seem to remember um, that I believe it was uh, Ms. Owen, Brianna Owen, who mm -hmm. talked about uh, the report not being ready that they needed until June 21st, uh, June 30th, uh, yeah. 2021. Um, uh, to complete their report. So if that is true, why aren't we extending the freeze to that time I'm, period? I'm going to ask for a second on the motion and then oh, sorry. that's okay. I'm sorry. 
So Second. I, thank you. And then Paul, can you respond to Pat's question? Yeah, so initially there, the, the working group has two sections in their charge. One is to look at an alternative form of policing, which is what was, was supposed to be done by this month okay. and that will be March 31st. And that's where you, we want to have the resources available to shift if that were, if they come up with something different. And that's still on the table. The other is more of an oversight of the police department. And that's the second phase, which, and they're still targeting that for June 30th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Alyssa, you have your hand up. So I touched base with the town manager today because the charge we were provided with this request has not yet been revised to show that the first written report to the town manager by January 15th, obviously that date has passed and that written report hasn't been provided. So I'm asking that he just clarify that although the town council worked with him on the initial charge, it is my belief that the town council is no longer and never really was in charge of the charge for the community safety working group. What we're in charge of is the deadline that this motion is the subject of. But just to clarify, because this is all new to all of us, is that the community safety working groups reports written in their charge are the, the date for the first one, the written report on alternative options to public safety services currently provided by the Amherst Police Department is going to be changed by the town manager, not by the town council, to March 15th, because that still gives that two week gap, right? That's how we set it up originally, two weeks before it was due to the town council. So I'm assuming that that's going to happen with the charge based on the town manager's action after our meeting tonight, assuming we agree on a date, he'll pick something then for the community safety working group that's two weeks prior to that, so that their charge is current. And I'm seeing a nod from the town manager. Do you want to speak to that, Paul? I, I agree 100% with that, that once the council says that the, the, the March 31st date is okay, then uh, the charge will be adjusted. Great. Is there any other question? Alyssa, you still have your hand up, but I assume it's because you haven't taken it down. Are there any other questions? Darcy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wonder how um, how the state works with the whole budget process and the police department plumbing to the finance committee with their projected budget. How does that all interrelate? Um, so yes, it, it, um, the idea, I think the council chose January 31st to, so that there's plenty of time to be able to, to take any recommendation from the working group or the town manager to implement it in the current budget and also next year's budget. So this delays it for two months. It still gives us, gives me time to implement anything that they want in next year's budget. My budget doesn't get delivered to the town council till May 1st. So that still gives us a month in there um, to, if there are substantive changes for next year's budget as well, to be incorporated into the budget process. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Darcy, you still have your hand up, but I assume it's because you haven't taken it down. Okay. So the motion has been made and seconded. Are there any other questions? Okay, then I'm going to begin the roll call with Dorothy Pam. Aye. Kevin Ross. Aye. Rick Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Tony Balmilm. Yes. Liz Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy DeMont. Yes. And Grace Prison, aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. 13 0 0 0. Okay, we are going to move on to uh, the presentation on. No, I'm sorry. We still have to do the referral of the two recommended motions that change the goals on uh, the housing authority, housing affordability and 
racial equity, social justice. Before we do that motion, I would like George Ryan just to speak to the purpose of the uh, recommended change to the housing affordability goal. Sure, Lynn. Um, I'm in a somewhat awkward position because I actually don't support the motion, but uh, we'll get to that eventually, I suppose. Um, in other words, the motion to refer. But um, a number of us have been concerned about, I mean, we've been very fortunate, uh, thanks to the hard work of, of the uh, Craig Stores and, and the town staff and the town manager and the stepping forward of the, the, uh, the UU here in Amherst. Um, and we have more than adequately met the challenge this year with the seasonal shelter. Um, but come uh, the end of the season, as it's called, um, the Universal, Universalist Church is going to want their community room back. My understanding is that the, uh, the Baptist Church is no longer um, interested in being part of the shelter solution. And so we're going to find ourselves again, as we have in the past, uh, looking for a seasonal shelter in Amherst. Um, and so what a number of us have uh, mentioned and talked about informally is um, approaching the town manager and asking him to consider uh, looking into the possibility of finding uh, or whether it's possible to find some kind of surplus town land or property and or work with uh, uh, the local community to see if we can find a, a permanent uh, solution to the problem, whether it be seasonal or year round. Um, and so that's the, the basic thrust um, behind this motion that um, we take a step and uh, ask the town manager to um, seriously look into what is possible um, either from the town's resources or working in uh, cooperation with um, private individuals or groups here in the town to effect a permanent uh, site uh, or solution to the, to the uh, seasonal shelter um, issue. Are there any other comments on this particular one? Please raise your hand using the raise hand function. Darcy. Yeah, I just wonder what the purpose of a referral would be. Um, I guess I feel I feel like we're probably fairly ready to just vote on this. Um, uh, I may not be right about that, but but uh, I am anyway. <laughs> so I, I just I don't understand why. What would be the purpose of a referral? This has never been discussed at the council meeting before, or at least not in recent in the recent months, I should say. And rather than spend a lot of time in discussion at council, the idea was to send it to GOL, which is the group that is in fact um, over does count does review the council the town manager's goals and comes back to the council with recommendations. That was the whole reason of doing it rather than sitting and having a big debate on this particular issue. But Mandy Jo, you have your hand up and you're on GOL. Um, yeah, I, I'm not commenting as a member of GOL, but um, I guess my only thing is I have one question and if the manager could answer it now, then I'm not sure I'd need a referral either. And that is, does the manager think this is a reasonable thing that can be completed or substantially made progress on given all the other goals that we have in the next five months since there's only five months left in this year? Mr. Roth, Paul. Yeah, so it is a priority for, for town staff. So, and I think it's important, you know, it's good for the council to weigh in on this as well. Um, and, you know, the, um, whether it's part of the goals or not, we'll be working on this. So, um, because, and I think it's a, it's because there's an urgency as Mr. Ryan mentioned, Councilor Ryan mentioned is that there's a, there's a date certain when the shelter will be leaving the UU and we need to be in working in conjunction with um, Craig stores to make sure there's a place for that to happen again, come November one. Okay. Um, George. Yeah, I think I would like us to go on record. Um, I really don't see the value of sending to GOL. Um, if it goes to anyone, it should probably go to TSO in the sense that it's about a policy decision and has many different impacts. 
But I, I agree with Darcy. I think uh, maybe we're both wrong, but I think that there has been a strong consensus amongst the, my colleagues that this is an issue that we need to address. As uh, Mr. Bachman just pointed out, time is pressing. Um, November, uh, the season will begin again, and we will be back at ground zero. And uh, this, I'm not sure, maybe the town can't find a solution, but I think um, I'd like us to go on record as a body asking him to do what in fact he is doing and to give him a sense that this is a priority for us. Okay, then in that case, um, Athena, can you find the original set of motions where this was in fact a motion? Just a moment. I believe I've got it and could read it. Okay. Athena, uh, then Mandy Joe, why don't you make the motion? Okay. Um, let me just get to the right page. That motion would be, um, oh wait, that's the, hold on. I can read it as well, Mandy, if you want. Oh, I'm sorry, George, fine. Um, yeah, George. This is what was, yeah, if you've got it, uh, it was sent to you, but that, the draft motion would read that in the document titled Town Council Performance Goals for the Town Manager July 1, 2020 to June 30, 2021, the following text be added at the end of section five of the policy goals entitled housing affordability. Quote, and exploring the possibility of creating a permanent seasonal or year round shelter in Amherst, either through the repurposing of surplus town building or land and or through working in partnership with concerned community groups or individuals to realize this goal. End of quote. So that would be inserted at the end of uh, item in section five after item three, we come now item four. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Okay, is there any further discussion on this? Alyssa, you have your hand up. Yes, it's just a variation on what's already on our motion sheet. Our motion sheet is fine. It just needs a couple of adjustments, which includes the fact that what George just read off, it needs to say adopted September 14th, 2020, just like we did under the previous one. So it's just a matter of slicing and pasting, but all the words are there. Athena, are you clear enough on that or do you need that read again? Oh, I, I've got it, thank you. Okay, any further discussion on this? Then I'm going to move to a vote and I'm going to start with Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Steve, uh, Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Shalini Bonilm. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy DeMont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Okay, that motion passes. Now we're gonna move on to the um, suggested additions to the racial equity and social justice goal, which is goal six of our town manager goals. And Alyssa, you were the one that uh, suggested this. Would you please speak to it? Yes, so as it so happens, I had a chance to see the motion sheet and I saw the one about housing and I was like, hey, while we're working on this already, so um, since we were already digging into the town manager's goals, um, and as you can see on your motion sheet, basically all this one does is it doesn't change any of the items one, two, and three that are under the goal. What it does is it inserts the additional resolutions that we've had since the one about George Floyd, right? So the ones about structural racism and because we're so timely, the one we just did tonight, because it's important once we do these things, right? Just like historically, we, we know that town meeting would get excited about doing a really cool thing and then like plop, like it got sent to McGovern and everybody else, but like, what did we really do with it? And so what we're trying to do is show that we really are engaging in a path of remedy. And one of the many ways we do that is we include all these resolutions that address these very issues about ensuring all community members feel a part of and are listened to, community free of intimidation, etc. So it just makes sense to go ahead and if we're going to mention any of our 
proclamations and resolutions to go ahead and include these two newer ones as well while we're already making edits because we need to kind of keep them together. Okay. Is there any further? Well, you know, let me ask for a motion then because it appears to me that what we would like to do is have a motion to go ahead and pass this versus a motion to refer. So Alyssa. So I think if Athena could get the wording exactly right, much like George did earlier, and that is along the lines of, and my screen's not cooperating with me right now. Um, sorry, it's kind of like scrolling madly past where I wanna go. But looking at the motion sheet itself, instead of it being a referral, it should basically just reflect the same kind of language we just used with the previous motion, which is to May I help amend the town council performance goals for the town manager July 1, 2020 to June 30, 2021, adopted September 14, 2020, by changing under policy goal, and in this case, it's six VI, racial equity and social justice, so that it reads, so that it adds in the two additional resolutions. The town council, the town council resolution affirming the town of Amherst commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity for black residents adopted on December 7th, 2020. And the town council resolution condemning the January 6, 2021 insurrection and violence at the US Capitol adopted 2020. January 25, 2021, so that the section reads, and then it goes on in full objective to explore, recommend, and implement policies and procedures that address racial equity and social justice consistent with, then it lists all three of the items that we're now including here. And then it says that one, ensure all community members feel and are a part of Amherst and feel and are protected, listened to, and served by their public servants. Two, foster a community free of fear, intimidation, and violence, and three, incorporate significant involvement of BIPOC residents in shaping these policies and procedures. Is there a second? Second, Ryan. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, we're going to move to the vote. George Ryan is first. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Aye. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Michelle Bellman. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. Unanimous 13 0 0 0. We are going to move on to the 7B, which is the proposal for anti-racism training for counselors. And I'm going to call on Pat DeAngelis and Shalini Balmilne to discuss the proposal. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanna read a little bit from the proposal uh, because it's reflective of some of what happened um, at the community safety working group um, where council members have inter have participated in the conversation, not just in their last Saturday's meetings, but at other times. And there is a sense that that's okay uh, when it, um, and so uh, we are really a council with a limited racial and social socioeconomic diversity, and we are not representative of the larger Amherst, Amherst community. Our experiences and understanding about structural racism and white supremacy are limited, and often, and this is the critical part that reflects on things that have happened, our bias is often unconscious and so in order to analyze issues from more than one perspective, we need to develop the ability to listen with understanding and integrate um, seemingly conflicting needs and viewpoints. 
And we need to do this work together in an environment built on trust in each other and in our desire for an ability to change. Um, I feel like if we are going to become the anti-racist town that I think uh, is a desire of every council member uh, and the staff, then we need to do the work and it is personal work. Um, and I know from my own experience that it can be uh, intimidating, um, it can be um, scary to do this work. But we have an opportunity, and uh, Chalonet is going to explain the workshop and the group, but we have an opportunity to come together um, to look at ourselves in, a, in an environment that, where we can trust one another. Chalonet? Yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are proposing as a training, but before that, I just wanted to share two things about the training that, thanks to Pat, I got to participate in. And uh, so it's personal and it was really powerful for me. So two things that I took away from the training that we did um, with the People's Institute. The first thing that I learned from that training was the system is not broken. It's working exactly how it's supposed to be working. And that was really powerful for me. Yeah, the system is not broken. It's working exactly how it's supposed to work. And unless we make undoing racism a priority and take deliberate steps, we are perpetuating these systems of racism. The second thing that was really powerful for me was also that why do we need to do this work? Of course, <laughs> with 300 years or more overdue. But besides that, is that it's all of our well being is tied to ending racism. So this is not that we're doing this for those people, or it's all of us need to do it because no one is safe unless we're all safe. And we can only flourish as a community when we create conditions for all of us to flourish. So, and besides that, as Pat said, we need a safe space to do this deep work. This is hard, it's deep. And, you know, just the every other day we're coming up with new situations that require deep thought and reflection and honesty and, and safety. Even for us as counselors, this is very vulnerable stuff. And for us to really learn and change deeply, we cannot, we have to have the safety to be able to ask and share what's going on for us. And if we don't have that opportunity, we can't really change deeply. So with that in mind, we're proposing um, that the council participate in the Undoing Racism workshop with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Uh, this is a virtual training. It's two and a half days long and is limited to 20 to 22 people. The cost uh, would be paid by the council budget and is about $350 per attendee. Um, this organization is really creditable, credible. It was founded in 1980 and um, by community organizers, Ronald Chisholm of New Orleans and Dr. Jim Dunn of Yellow Springs. It's impacted over 1 million people around the world with over 100 teachers. And um, I just believe it will be a great opportunity for us to develop a common language, to, to uh, even talk about these issues, to understand racism, to understand how we can then work with our constituents with more sensitivity. And um, yeah, there's just so many benefits. So we'd be happy to take any questions. Um, Sean, I want to make sure that we have the timer. Um, questions from the council. I'm going to start with one or two that I have, and then we'll see what other people have. How long, when you say two and a half days, are we saying eight mm -hmm. hour days? Can you give be a little more clear about what that means? Yeah, usually the first night, which is a Friday night, is from 5.30 to about 8. Um, and then Saturday and Sunday would be between 9 and 5, 9 and 4, um, mm -hmm. with a break, for, um, a reasonable, seriously reasonable break for lunch. Mm -hmm. 
Is there any way to break it up so it's not a solid two and a half days? I think that would be a mistake. I don't think they will do that, but I also think it's a mistake because part of the process mm -hmm. is really diving in and, and focusing for a period of time. And, you know, we're all home anyway. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't have other commitments and things mm -hmm. like that. We all do. Um, but I think that this is a commitment that would help us move miles in terms of creating bridges with the BIPOC community uh, and building trust with the BIPOC community. Okay. I'm gonna take questions, Mandy Jo. My question is similar. I support this initiative. Um, I obviously have scheduling concerns, um, especially as one of the few counselors that has a kid at home that is at home on weekends and if this is on weekends. But um, so, so my question relates, I guess, to would it be expected that we are all um, doing the same training on the same weekend um, such that, you know, I, I don't even know whether we could find a weekend that all 13 of us are available, but beyond that, if we aren't, or would we be offered a number of different choices that we could pick the weekend that is um, most fits in our schedule, even if not other counselors are attending that? I, I guess I'm asking what the vision for that type of participation is from you. Um, Shalane, do you wanna say something first? Yeah, I, I feel uh, I, in our discussion, we were gonna plan for something out in April. So everyone, we would have enough time to plan and do, a, you know, that thing, what's it called? Doodle pull. Doodle pull, thank you. <laughs> uh, so we can try and find. And if we're not able to, then we probably could plan for having to. But go ahead. I think, though, that the reason that we are hoping we can bring the council together and hopefully um, Mr. Mm -hmm. Bockelman and other staff members who is we work together and we work together collaboratively. Um, and this is a chance for us to be um, both learning, uh, facilitate each other's learning, and to be vulnerable with each other in a way that we, um, our society doesn't normally allow us to be. Um, I think it would expand our ability to function as a group of people um, on so many levels, uh, as well as beginning to move us towards a real and, and a deep and true anti-racist stance personally. Um, um, so, and we would have to, we could decide to spread people out and have some kind of um, way, make you know, a way to make sure that everybody has followed through. But there's something, there's power in our, this group doing it together. A clarification, is there a minimum number of people that have to enroll in order for them to run the class? That I don't know. Okay, we need to find that out so that if we ended up with two options or something, can they still do it or would they be adding in other people, which might be fine as well, okay? Uh, Alyssa, you have your hand up. Thank you. Having participated in a variety of different types of anti-racism training since I entered the school committee in 2002, um, I can appreciate that there's a huge variety of ways to do this. And while the schedule is somewhat daunting, I also understand the purpose of having that intensive period of time because I know that some of the things that I was engaged in that didn't meet very regularly, it was kind of hard to keep up the conversation in between, particularly because then somebody would have a scheduling conflict and so it wouldn't be the same exact people associated with the particular conversation. So following up on, on what Lynn said about minimums and then just the scheduling in general, I think what appeals most to me about doing it through you know this particular venue at this time, rather than just saying, we'll all go off and do some kind of training, right? That we should just check that off that we've all done it like our ethics training or something is that the, I, I understand the purpose of the group doing it together, much like when we try and have retreats and have all of us there. But I have two concerns. One is that if all 13 of us can't do it, but 11 of us do it, that's going to feel a little weird to the two that aren't there. But so I'm, I'm just not sure how people feel, feel about that. But then the other part of it is, is if it's going to be 13 of us plus maybe 
Paul plus maybe Athena, whether they think that's appropriate or not is another conversation. And then five random people from the community, like no, that no, doesn't, no, 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 that, no, that I want to be clear. That's not discussed anywhere here in this proposal that it's only for us. Uh, I thought, uh, so, I thought it was, I apologize. And so being clear on that. And so mm -hmm. the number that you're talking about, that's greater than 13 would be the expectation that staff would do that. And I can understand that some staff may not necessarily feel comfortable doing that with us. So I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Right. I, uh, it's, um, I, I one really, of the, excuse me, Pat, Sean, we need to have the clock. Thank you. One of the, um, I've lost my train of thought. I apologize. I'm sorry, Pat. No, that's okay. Um, <laughs> one of the things that um, it, it is the reason that we're opening it to more staff uh, and it would be their decision uh, is because we feel like we work together. And yes, mm -hmm. there are the counselors, but there's also staff. But my real point was that we're not, I'm not, I'm trying to make sure that we uh feel that we are in a in a in a safe space uh and the inviting outside community members feels that does not feel at this particular point comfortable to me i've been talking to other people about uh you know deborah snow about the possibility of ongoing conversations about race that included residents and i think that may be a place that we get to but as a white person who has since when i first started doing this work and in workshops and each time i do it i need to feel that i can say anything or do anything and it's not going to be then spread out through um, my community whether that was living at pomeroy lane cooperative being part of the council or uh, being a member of a church, which was uh, the case in the 70s when I did participate in my first uh, ra anti-racism training. So it's very important that we, and, and ugh, I'm going to go on. I have a little bit more time. This is weird. The other thing is we thought very much of having um, the ch um, chief of police, and I actually hope that he would want to do it. And then um, Chief Nelson from the fire department, Jennifer Moyston. And all of a sudden I'm saying, wait a minute, um, we're gonna invite two uh, people of color, maybe more, I don't know how many are on staff. I know um, Elwood uh, and I'm, blanking on his last name, who's a maintenance person, is a person of color and a friend, but um, I don't want them to have to speak for the entire BIPOC community or black community. And I think that this is a time where um, the trainers and the facilitators are people of color and they're used to working mm -hmm. both with integrated groups and uh, BIPOC groups only and white groups only. And I think that's it. Okay. Um, Darcy Dumont, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I um, support this idea. I think it's a good idea. Um, I would try to make myself available to do it. Um, I do, I did Google uh, the link that you put in your report and um, I, I, it looks like it wasn't available during the pandemic. Um, no, the training we did was virtual that Shalanae and, uh, mm -hmm. Shalanae and I participated in, and this would be a virtual training. And um, I just recommend so there are, look at the link because it has a big red uh, notice on it saying not- Probably available. not in person, that's all. I don't know. Just because we just did it during COVID. We took it in, during COVID virtually. Recently. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will Schreiber. look, but. Mm -hmm. Steve Schreiber, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I, I'm going to 
echo what everyone else said that I think that this is incredibly useful. Um, somebody with a full-time job, I would love to make it work, but we'll, um, that's gonna be the real challenge with this many people. I guess I, I have some technical questions here. One is procurement. So we're talking about multiple thousands of dollars and do we have to get proposals from other groups or is this gonna be a sole source provider? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, okay. it's less than ten thousand dollars, and we don't need to, I believe. Okay. Um, the second one is open meeting law. So, if we all meet as a group, isn't that a? No, it's not. I've also okay. I've already yep. contacted the attorney okay. general's office twice, as a matter of. You want to use up my three minutes? So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and then the uh, third one is timing. So, in April, which is of the date discussed, we have six months left together as a council. And you know a lot can be accomplished in that six months. But to me, this sounds like an amazing kind of training, or that should happen at the beginning of every council term. So that doesn't mean it can't happen again in December when the new, or I'm sorry, January when the new council. When is it? December? It's January, right? January, January is when they're sworn in. Yeah. I'm, I'm, my math is off here. So we have eight months left together. So it sounds like an amazing thing to do every January. Um, this being, <laughs> but so it may end up, we do it twice or whatever, but I, I think that we should think about that also, just the timing of a, you know, a reasonably big expense for a council that will be, is almost our term together is in the late afternoon. It's in the, the twilight. Uh, Evan Ross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you to, um, Penn and Shalini for putting the work into this proposal. Um, and I think it's a good idea for the council to do an anti-racism training. But I did just want to hear my one concern, which you probably will expect, um, is that I, I do worry about setting the precedent of committing the counselors to a two and a half day training um, only because and this is where I'm conflicted because I know you can't do a two hour training on anti-racism and be like, Oh, all right, we're good now. Mm -hmm. I've done these things. I know they take time. I know they take um, investment. At the same time, I do have some concerns um, at a time when we're trying, especially going into an election where we're trying to send the message that the counselor job is not a part-time job, that it's very workable. Um, and one of the things that I've really tried to do is carve out weekends as time when I don't have to do council stuff, which is why most of you notice I don't respond to your emails on the weekends. Um, I'm probably willing to give a weekend to do this, but I do just worry a little bit about a precedent of people looking and saying, not only do I need to do six hour council meetings twice a month on Mondays and committee meetings and district meetings and go to public forums, but also there might be mandatory trainings that take up an entire weekend. And so I'm not arguing against this and I'm perfectly willing to do it, <laughs> but, I, but I am saying that it always does concern me a little bit anytime we create an additional requirement or an additional expectation of counselors. Um, Cause I have the privilege to be able to do it. I don't have a family. I don't use my weekends to take my kids to soccer, whatever parents do. Um, but, but I do want to air that concern. I, I just want to reply, but in the last two years, I mean, this time it was different. Uh, we've gone to Boston to the MMA mm -hmm. conference away from our families on the weekends. The town paid for it. Nobody had any problems with that. Um, so um, I think if your desire is to do the work in terms of looking at ourselves as participating in a system of white supremacy, then you're going to put aside a weekend. Mm -hmm. And I feel strongly that what you will get in back is so much rich, richer than either Shalini, Shalini and I or mm -hmm. I could explain to you. Mm -hmm. um, and I... And I, you know, whether it becomes mandatory for every council uh, in the future, uh, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, but that's not my goal. My goal is that we have been wrestling in many ways uh, with two, ve two very unique uh, issues as a council, COVID 
You know, none of us ever anticipated anything like that. But we're also really dealing and, and wrestling with racism in the United States of America, which has been here and is embedded in the capitalist system. You know, you don't, I don't need to go on and say all of those things. But we really need to do this and do it now. Um, and I'm, I'm for the life of our, for our own lives and the life of our community. Dorothy, I'm going to take your comment and then I'm going to make a suggestion, please. Go ahead, Dorothy. Um, having been part of workshops such as this in the past, I, I really am sad that it would have to be virtual because the in-person is much stronger. Um, in response to Evan, in terms of, of uh, making the job seem doable to possible new uh, uh, counselors, we used to deal with this by offering food. Um, <laughs> so maybe you can deliver us food, who knows? Mm -hmm. But my feeling is sooner is better than later because I've got some stuff I have to do once I get my vaccination and I can go someplace. I've got, I've got things to do. Right now, I'm stuck at home <laughs> and I'd rather do it now than in April because April I hope to be visiting some new possible in-laws, et cetera. So, um, that's Whoa. my, yeah, I, it's, I've got some exciting stuff going on. Yeah. So I would, I would like to suggest that, uh, Shalini and, um, Pat, uh, go back to the source and come up with a proposed, uh, set of weekends and that we use those weekends to poll mm -hmm. how we can get, how close we can get to getting everybody involved mm -hmm. in one or two sessions. And I would suggest that you take those weekends as early as March, mm -hmm. as late as the end of April, and then stop with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can and, I just, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Can and, I offer a few clarifications to you that um, came up that there were people who, who stepped aside for some commitments for an hour or two. So that, you know, there are all of those things. It's not like once you're locked in, you I mean, the preference is you're locked in, but um, given that we'll have enough time to plan, hopefully you all can get that. And secondly, this is not just work for the council. This is just as human beings. I think we're all going to benefit and be just better people because of it. So uh, we, I just feel that we're lucky that as counselors, we get to do it. Uh, I don't, and, and, and um, third thing is, we didn't bring this up yet, but in case we need to split it up, is there a willingness to invite other counselors from other neighboring? This is like a regional thing we could be building also and invite other counselors to maybe be part of it. And that way they could be, in case we need to, we could have two blocks. And let's find out what the deal is in terms of minimum registration, okay? okay and do a poll before we go there. Alyssa, do you have another mm -hmm. question? Just a point about that last new idea of having other people and the answer for me is no. That mm -hmm. That's why I would be interested in this particular range of two and, of two and a half days is if it's us um, because of our shared culture and what we're trying to get moved forward because of what we're trying to learn. I'm happy to participate in other trainings with lots of other people and have done so over the years, but that doesn't feel like the right move right now. So finding a good date for a huge percentage of us seems like the only way to go. Okay. Um, is there any further discussion at this point? I think we're going to then, uh, as fast as we can get those possible dates, do a poll and uh, move forward, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini. I personally look forward to the training and thank you, Pat and Shalini, for putting this together. Um, the next item on the agenda is the uh, there's no town manager appointments, but we have some appointments. And let me just jump over and say, in serious and significant consultation with each of you, I did make the appointments to our to our council committees, um, but we still, as a council, need to decide uh, on who will represent us at JCPC Joint Capital and Planning Committee. Who will represent us on the Budget Coordinating Group? And let me just mention, we haven't actually called this group together, but in case we needed to, 
we still need representatives. And then we need to relook at the liaisons to our multiple member bodies. So let me start by saying, as you know, I do extensive polling of counselors. I pull that together and provide for you both a history of who has represented us where uh, in first year of our council, the second year. And then I also give you a sense of the priorities different people have placed on various things. Um, so given that the names of, there are five people who are interested in the JCPC appointment. Uh, the, let me just mention, the way that the charge reads is there can be no more than two people from the finance committee, but one definitely cannot come from finance, okay? And the five people, and I'm just gonna explain, are Councillor Griesmer, I am on the finance committee. Councillor Haneke, she is not on the finance committee. Councillor Ryan is not on the finance committee. Councillor Shane is on the finance committee and Councillor Steinberg is on the finance committee. So you can pick, you, what you cannot do is put three people from the finance committee on this. So what I would like to do is um, ask individuals who are interested to make a statement of their interest. And then um, I think we should ask each counselor to name their top three. So let's start in reverse order. Councilor Steinberg. Can I get some more potato chips? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Could you put an order in for me as well? <laughs> I wouldn't mind French fries. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Go ahead, Andy. I'm holding off until everybody's got their food order placed before I go and say anything. Now, I have been on uh, during Capital Planning Committee for a um, uh, number of years, both in the original Finance Committee on the select board and um, from the council. And uh, so one of the things that um, I offer to the committee, as you consider it as the history and under and somebody who has been through various years of the history. The other thing that I feel very strongly about is that I think that there is a an important link between Finance Committee and what uh, Joint Capital Planning Committee um, is doing and recommending a capital plan to the town manager because the capital plan has to fit in with the um, budget as a whole, that there are um, expenditures that at times can fall under operating or can fall under capital. Um, and that um, one of the charges to the uh, finance committee is to think about the large projects which come out of the amount that's available for capital. So that as we divide capital um, and say that we're gonna give uh, six, seven, eight, ten, up to 10% of tax revenue for um, capital purposes, that um, that includes paying back prior capital debt, um, new major capital expenditures envisioned into the future and uh, the uh, integration, therefore, is very strong. Okay. So uh, I, that is why I put my name forward. Okay. And we're going to keep our remarks short, maybe even a whole lot less than three minutes. Kathy Shane. Um, I, when I ran for town council, JCPC was always the committee I wanted to be on, and I had did not succeed in the first year, so I made myself an understudy, and I lit, went to literally every meeting, but sat out in the public comment area. Last year, I this past year, I did get on and was appointed or elected chair, and it was a most unusual year in that we had almost no capital to spend during the year. So we didn't write the normal report and we didn't go through the normal backlog. And so I would really like to be on a second year. Um, 
And as Andy said, what I found is that the link between really knowing what's in that backlog and the queue and our operating budget and thinking in the future is critical. You just you just can't get a picture of total town without knowing both. So um, I would appreciate being on both. I have more than enough time. I'm not under time constraints. And if for those of you who worry that it conflicts with the um, elementary school committee, the good thing about JCPC, it's the concentrated period of time that we have. And it, the work is done before the work of the other intensity, the other committee will start. So I have plenty of time. I'm only on one council committee, the finance committee. Um, several of the other people are on two, not counting JCPC. So I would really like to continue. Thank you. Councilor Ryan. Well, I have held back in my first two years from putting my name forward for either of these bodies. Um, partly because of sheer ignorance. Um, but I feel like I'm ready and very much motivated to dig in. I'm deeply concerned about the financial well-being of the town. I'm deeply concerned as all of us are about the capital projects. Um, so I feel I'm ready and definitely um, eager to serve. So I would be open to serving on both bodies. Um, I do have two other committees I serve on. Um, but the good news is I've retired. From your other job that used to pay you uh, That other job, yeah, yeah right. Got it, okay. Um, Councillor Haneke. Yeah, I, I think all I would say is I've enjoyed serving on this committee, um, trying to figure out how, what its role is in a new form of government. And I think that's still sort of evolving at this point. Um, and I would love to continue service on it. Okay, and I'm going to say I was on this the first year. I went to the meetings the second year, but was not on it. And I'm actually going to withdraw my name in the interest of allowing another counselor to have this experience. I do want to point out that I felt it was necessary to put my name here so people understand that this is where my interests are. Uh, I am continuing to serve on the Finance Committee. However, I also have given up GOL so that other counselors can have that experience. So it's really down to uh, counselors Haneke, Ryan, Shane, and Steinberg. And I'm just going to go through and I want you to name your top three. And uh, Athena, I'm going to probably need you to um, help me keep a record. Okay. Uh, hold on. Okay, so uh, we start in this case with Kathy Shane. Okay, and Lynn, can I just clarify, it's up to two finance, but it doesn't have to be two finance, is That's that correct? correct? Okay, then I, um, it's Mandy, George, and Kathy. Okay, Steve Schreiber. Um, can I pass, can you come back to me? I'm still. Yes. Um, Andy Steinberg. Um, Mandy, George, and Andy. Uh, Sarah Schwartz. Andy, Kathy, and Mandy. Andy, Kathy, and Mandy. Okay, got it. Um, Shalini Bomell. Um, <clears throat> Kathy Shane, um, Mandy, and George Ryan. Alyssa Brewer. I'm sorry, I'm struggling a little here too. If you could come back to me also, that would be great. I'm not counting votes. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what I'm doing. Okay, Kathy Angelis. Haneke, Steinberg, and Shane. Darcy Dumont. Darcy. Sorry, um, I think I'm going to just vote for two, Kathy and Mandy Joe. 
Christmas going to hold Haneke? I'm going to vote for um, Haneke, Ryan, and Shane. Darcy, Pam. Ryan, Shane, and Steinberg. Evan Ross. Uh, this is a tough vote, y'all, um, and especially doing it separately from the BCG, I just want to say. I wish we could do it together, but I think that I'm going to go with uh, Shane, Haneke, and Steinberg. George Ryan. Uh, Steinberg, Shane, Ryan. Steinberg. Okay, and I'm back to Steve Schreiber. George, Kathy, Andy. Okay, uh, and Alyssa. Anarchy, Ryan, and Steinberg. Four way tie. No, I've got. I've got 10 for Shane. I've got nine for Haneke. And I've got eight each for Ryan and Steinberg. Is that correct? That's what I got the same. I got the same like count, Lynn. Athena? Yes? Then may I ask if everyone has voted? No, I'm the only one that hasn't. I was trying to avoid it. <laughs> well, I could. I would withdraw my name then. I'd prefer to have Stan, Andy. If it's between Andy and myself, I would withdraw. All right. So it's Andy, Shane, and Haneke. Okay. That one's done. We're moving on to the next one. And I'm going to make it easy by withdrawing from that one because if we get into a really serious budget discussion, I'm going to have to be involved in it anyway. So let's just move on. And because in this case, there are two people from finance. Oh, I'm sorry, budget coordinating group. Oh, two from finance committee. So it has to be finance. Committee. No, it doesn't. That's okay. wrong. Thank you. So, <laughs> uh, it's Ryan and Shane. Okay. Any problem with that? Want to vote it? Mandy Joe. Um, we should check the rules of procedure because the charge doesn't require it from finance, but I wonder if that came from the rules. Oh. So before we vote, and I, I, in saying that, I would still love to see George Ryan on this, but. Mm -hmm. uh, Christina or someone, can you quickly pull up our rules? and see whether or not this committee requires that you have to be on finance. Oh, wait, sorry, it wasn't the rules, it was the finance charge. I'm, I'm trying to remember where the conflict was, it was the finance charge. And I think GOL fixed it. So maybe, hopefully we fixed it so there's no conflict. Yeah, I was just gonna say, maybe we should just fix the charge if it hasn't been and go ahead with it. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Yes. All right. I'm going to call for a vote. And the two people in this case are Shane and Ryan. All you have to do is say yes. All right. Uh, I'm going to start in this case with Steve Schreiber. And the vote is yes or no? Yes or no. <laughs> yes. Steinberg. Yes. Schwartz. Yes. Paul Milne. Yes. I'm sorry, I know it's voting time, but I'm confused. There's only two people and there's only two seats. I would but that means that one of them is on both bodies. Uh, that means that Shane is on both bodies, yes. No. 
Okay. That doesn't make sense to me. No. All right. Uh, DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Yes. Reese Mercy. Yes. Haneke. No. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. So the vote is actually 11 in favor, two opposed, no, no abstentions and no absence. Uh, would either, Alyssa, you told, you mentioned your reason, Mandy, Joe, did you have an issue? Did you want to discuss? I would just say I um, supported Alyssa's reasons. Okay, thank you. So those two are done. Let's very quickly look at the. Um... Kathy has a has her hand up. No, Kathy. Okay, Lynn, I just want to say something. Um, I, I almost didn't put BCG on for that reason, and hasn't really been meeting as a committee we've been meet the one time we called it together was the crisis this past year where we had to have everybody there i mean and the whole council came so it's on paper a committee so i did i just want to explain you know i put it as a number two when asked to rank and i actually considered not doing it and then we wouldn't have even had two people saying yes so just it's a point of clarification on what does this committee actually do <laughs> uh, and and it has never met in the history of this town council in the past it used to meet if there was budget crisis and the reality is we've tended to um, use the finance committee and then when we call a committee that when we call a meeting that includes the school committee and the uh, Jones Library trustees, for the purposes of dealing with the budget, we refer to it as the Budget Coordinating Committee. Um, people in the future may want to change that, or there may be reason to change it, but we now have two representatives. All right. Um, on the next memo is the whole issue of um, liaisons and we had only a couple instances where more than one uh, counselor has expressed interest in a being a liaison. So for affordable housing, Pat DeAngelis is the only counselor. The Board of Health, George Ryan has been doing that and Dorothy Pam has expressed interest. Um, blah, 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 blah. Hold on, I've got to find my, okay, raise hand. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I just was being accommodating, so withdraw my name. Yep, got it. This is what we did last time. Uh, yep. Licensed commissioners, Alyssa Brewer is the only person that has expressed interest. Uh, Community Preservation Act was Dorothy Pam and Kathy Shane. Either one of you want to withdraw? I could. I could withdraw. Well, uh, Council on Aging, Dorothy Pam is the only person expressing interest. Disability Advisory Access Advisory Committee, Pat DeAngelis is the only one expressing interest. LSSE Commission, Dorothy Pam, Steve Shriver, if needed. So I would say Dorothy Pam. Well, you know. I yield to the distinguished counselor from. I was going to yield to you, Steve. So no. I say I was just being obliging to fill those things out. Um, uh, um, so um, how about Steve, if you take that on? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I've got a lot of committees I, I, I attend. Yeah, yeah, and I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Great. And then transportation advisory, we have DeAngelis, Dumont, and Schreiber if needed. But, uh, Darth, Darcy is the person who's doing it now. I'd like to keep that if I could. DeAngelis, Pat, or Steve, I mean, Concerns? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, second for Darcy. For Darcy, okay. Pat, any concern? Where is Pat? I'm here. Oh, there you are. Hi there. I've been here. 
I don't remember putting my name in for transportation um, advisory committee. Easy, it might have been a year ago that I did that, and I'm not. I don't have the time now because I'm involved with some other stuff like the mobile market. Following up, we then would be serving as liaisons, and so this is a motion to appoint following town councilors as liaisons to town multiple member bodies under town council rules procedure. 10.8 counselors as non-voting liaisons effective immediately for the terms expiring January, actually it's January 5th, 2022. Uh, affordable Housing, Pat DeAngelis. Uh, Board of Health, George Ryan. Board of License Commissioners, Alyssa Brewer. Uh, Community Preservation Act, Kathy Shane. Council on Aging, Dorothy Pam. Disability Advisory Committee, Pat DeAngelis. LSSC Commission, otherwise known as Amherst Recreation, uh, Steve Schreiber, and Transportation Advisory Committee, Darcy Dumont. Is there a second? Darcy, second. Darcy Pam is seconded. Uh, we're going to quickly take that vote and we're starting with Andy Steinberg. Point of order is uh, it probably should just say Recreation Commission and not say LSSC at all at this point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, Andy. Yes. You're taking your vote now? Yeah, we're, vote, we're moving to the vote. And it's your turn. And I vote yes. Okay. <laughs> Schwartz. Aye. Kelly Bonnell. Yes. Melissa Brewer? Yes. Kathy Angelus? Aye. Leslie Devont? Yes. Bruce Mears, aye. Haneke? Aye. Pam? Aye. Evan Ross? Aye. Ryan? Yes. Jane? Yes. Driver? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. We're done with that. Um, moving on to um, uh, committee and li liaison reports. CRC, made Joe. Yeah, um, just a couple of short things because I know it's late. I want to first thank outgoing CRC member Sarah Schwartz, Councilor Schwartz. Um, your contributions have been invaluable and we're gonna miss you. Um, but I also wanna welcome back, I guess, <laughs> Councillor Pam, um, who is rejoining CRC. So, uh, and I wanna give you a warning. I hope you're ready for a busy committee calendar um, cause it's, it's gonna be busy the next couple of months. Um, housing policy, as you saw in the, the CRC report, uh, please read it. Please get the comments to us if you have any comments. I also wanna state we're hoping to have a council discussion in the near future on this housing policy. So it's not just your only opportunity to get, getting comments to the committee in writing will not be your only opportunity as a counselor to comment on this draft before it gets a vote in the CRC. Um, I will be working, I'll be working with the president to figure out when that's happening, but there will be something at a council meeting coming. And so I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and then similarly with zoning priorities, we're meeting, CRC is meeting with the planning board on February 3rd. So um, I'll, I'll say that again for Councillor Pam because she might not have had it on her calendar and she'll be a member as of that point, February 3rd at 6.30 um, at the request of the planning board to discuss the zoning priorities. Um, and we are working on engagement plans and outreach plans, um, both for counselors and for the public regarding zoning priorities, discussions are happening. Um, and I just wanna give a heads up to everyone that a likely part of that will include district meetings. So I hope the district counselors are all on board with talking about zoning at district meetings to get feedback. <laughs> so I just wanna give a heads up, but but when we get a better definitive plan, I'll definitely bring that to the council to let the council know and present it. Thank you. Just point of clarification. Both, I think all the states have a meeting. Multiple member bodies 
body's motion to appoint the following town councillors mm -hmm. as liaisons to town multiple yeah. member bodies under town council rules of procedure. Thank you. Um, what was that? It was somebody listening to a tape. Um, so uh, all of that aside, Mandy Jo, uh, there are district meetings scheduled, I believe, for every district in February. Do you believe it'll be ready for discussion then? You're, you're muted. Yeah, Maybe. not every zoning priority um, because that, you know, you, you kind of have to give the planning department some time to figure out the zoning, you know, drafts um, and stuff. But no, I, I really don't know. The, the CRC hasn't fully discussed a plan yet. I know there's um, some meetings tomorrow um, to discuss some stuff. You know, I've had meetings with our vice chair and um, Dave Zomek, our liaison about this. And so, you know, and CRC will discuss a potential plan, even if the dates are, are um, vague um, tomorrow. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'll, I hope to have more information soon. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathy, you submitted a, an elementary school building committee report. Are there, is there anything you would like to highlight briefly from that report? And if not, we'll ask for questions. Um, yeah, I would uh, just one major highlight. Um, we received back from the MSBC these, uh, um, the certification of enrollment. And I highlighted in the report what that is. What, so what the school building committee will be looking at as we go forward is uh, two possible designs. One is a grade K through five consolidated school where we go from three schools down to two, but they are a K through five and the sixth grade moves to the middle school. And that would be at about 575 enrollment. And the other would be keeping all three schools and doing one new or one new renovated K through six. Um, with And in each case, the site would be determined, whether it's Wildwood or Fort River, down the road. So we are down to those two enrollment certification choices. Um, and and uh, there was a discussion of this initially at the school committee before we signed off. We did raise in a discussion just before um, we had to sign. It was a sign it or come back another year and get in the queue. But there was a discussion of an option of K through six with Crocker being bigger. And unless we were ready as a town to pay for the Crocker share, um, we weren't gonna be given that option as a, a study design. And we should come back again if that's what we wanted. So we're down to these two choices. We as a committee have selected a subcommittee that will be working on the our request for proposals or request for services for an OPM. So that would be the next stage that we would be invited into. And our next meeting, I put the dates in it, is um, in February after MSBA meets. So we're trying to get ready to be on the street with that as soon as possible after being officially invited in. So I'll take any questions. We haven't put out, the one point, I, what thing I'd like to say is we have not yet as a town or as a school committee put out um, a press release or anything that would make this widely known to the town. And one of the advice we heard was communicate as soon as possible and as often as possible. So these are the choices we have if we stay in the pipeline, which we are planning on doing. So there is an implication for the design of our school system here. Can I uh, ask Kathy just before I go to questions? You know, this is, you finally got to the point that the committee had done enough that there was something to report. Do you see this as a monthly report or a report that comes when some significant next step has been accomplished? Um, I think, I think um, it can be a monthly update. So for example, next month it might be 
the request for services is out on the street, <laughs> um, but it won't have an activity. I think we absolutely would do a, a longish report, you know, more substantive when we're before we're at a key juncture of making a decision. It's something Alyssa had raised in our retreat. And I think that's right, that we would be saying, you know, a month from now, we're going to have to be making this decision. Um, and and there'll be a meeting about that. And we will know that in, the way the process works, the timeline it's it's pretty slow. It's not like, oh dear, next week we have to make this decision. You know, we it's it's in a series of stages with MSBA also signing off on are you ready for the next one yet? Um, so that so I think it could be just an update, Lynn, in the future. But it's certainly not every two weeks reporting because it's not moving that fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, there are questions, Barbara. Dorothy. Um, I have um a question with numbers on page one and two. On page one, the second uh, bullet, new K-6 grade elementary school with 320 students. But on page two, choice three has a new school with 420 students. Um, that, I, I can explain. I, that. Okay, I can explain. So it, it, I might not have written it clearly. We originally went to MSBA saying this is what we'd like our choices to be. And we specified 420. And that 420 was a design that allowed a bilingual program and an option of English only in a school, in mm -hmm. one school, um, that that was the classroom sizes you needed to make that work. MSBA came back to us and said, not 420, but 320, because you have space in all of your schools to accommodate it. I got it. So re redesign your curriculum because you've got enough space. So just figure out how you're going to do the curriculum. They like the bilingual program, but it's um, we're not going to give you the extra space in that school. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Thank you. Moving along. Maybe Joe. Yeah, I guess one of my questions is on a similar vein. Um, I know these numbers were lower than the committee and the school committee and the superintendent had originally wanted and talked about when we initially applied for the program. And I'm guessing part of that is because um, the MSBA capacity calculations assume classroom sizes that are larger than classroom sizes in our school committee's policy. And so I guess one of the things I want to talk about or just bring up is um, what, how is that going to be dealt with um, going forward? Um, the fact that a 320 K6 Fort River assumes capacities that our superintendent generally has reported would be above bursting at the seams, particularly at Crocker, that they say is already ops really full. Um, and they assumed a Crocker study at 50 students more than where it is now. Um, and how does that affect, and, and these aren't questions you can necessarily answer now, but how does that affect the reimbursement rate if we have to build a school larger than that because we are subsidizing our classroom sizes? Um, so I think that's just things to keep in mind as we're going forward. Um, and I did wanna comment on the subcommittee. I'm glad there's a subcommittee. I noticed though that there aren't any quote school members on that subcommittee that it's two community members and then three members from the town side of the committee, not the school side. And, you know, I'm not questioning the qualifications of anyone on that committee, I want to say that, but I did notice that that seemed a bit strange for a OPM subcommittee that's going to be picking an owner's project man manager um, for an elementary school building to have no one from the schools on that subcommittee. Um, so let me just respond, and Steve can respond to um, the first task of the subcommittee is drafting the um, request for proposals, the request for services, and we had a full committee discussion of specific items, and some of this is almost boilerplate where you just fill in some blanks on it, and then we talked about what other elements, and we fully intend to bring that full draft back to the the full committee. And so Mike Morris, the others will be um, reviewing that. And similarly, the subgroup will be doing interviews and background checks and bringing three or four finalists back to the full committee. Um, so it won't be that all the decisions are made by a subcommittee. 
Um, so this was a group that was willing to focus on the elements of this initially. So Steve, I don't know whether you want to add anything to that. Well, I, I think in principle, the, the committee members are selected from the various bodies, but in the end, we're one elementary school building committee. So our, you know, our, we have the same commitment. So I don't think that we think of it in the way that you're thinking of it, um, Councilor Haneke, that we're representing the town council on this, but that basically we're representing the school committee then by extension, the larger community on this subcommittee. You know, I think Paul Paul had his hand up also. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Mr. Bachman. So I just want to point out that Dwayne Chamble is an employee of the school district and uh, the, the superintendent was pleased that he stepped up to rep in representing the school in a certain way. Thank you for that, because he's listed as a community member on the he, list. He is, but he's also an employee of the school. Okay. I'm going to skip over Dorothy and go to Alyssa because Dorothy's already asked a question. Dorothy, Alyssa. Thank you. I just want to, and I appreciate the report. And like you said, Kathy, I really wanted this. And so I really look forward to continuing to get them. Um, looking near the end of the report where it says, we tentatively agreed that the town school committee would issue a press release to regarding receipt of the enrollment certification and next steps. So it's late even though it's not as late as usual, but that press release has to be much more user-friendly than anything that's been done before ever. Because the place we're at right now makes no sense to people in terms of how we're supposed to possibly figure out not only the details of what Mandy Joe just talked about in terms of the numbers, which the numbers don't make sense to what people's experiences are of the school, but also this idea of making this choice between doing something with Fort River and doing nothing with Wildwood, because that's what that choice is, and doing a consolidated school. So people need a much better understanding of, are we just opening this up to the whole world of the community to say, sure, we're going to do a survey, pick one, and then we'll go with that? Or is there actually going to be a drive to figuring out what makes sense for our school population and saying, this is our better choice, and this is when the decision points are, and this is who makes them? Um, so I'm saying you have your work cut out for you in terms of a press release that's going to actually mean anything to anybody. Um, I don't that requires a response, but just a, you know, observation. Felony? Yeah, it was very similar to what Alyssa was going to say in terms of uh, just making sure that the communi community is moving along with you as the d critical decision making points and what, and maybe even setting them out on the uh, website, the town website or somewhere that this is when what is going to happen. And so, and then and also having a good plan for, <clears throat> besides press release, how are we going to let people, the stakeholders, teachers, students, parents, how to keep them informed, have a good plan for that. Okay. Kathy, thank you for your thorough report. We look forward to future updates. Uh, Finance Committee, Andy. Oh, I'll be very brief. The Finance Committee is meeting tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. There are essentially three items on the agenda, um, one of which is the third quarter, uh, or sorry, excuse me, second quarter FY21 finance report that's the, the regular quarterly budget report. And those of you who are interested in it, it is in the packet that is posted under the, on the Finance Committee page for the Council. Um, the uh, other major item, another major item we're discussing tomorrow will be uh, sort of the first time that the Finance Committee is talking about a matter that was referred by the Council, and that is the two resolutions that we will have to be considering later in the year regarding wastewater. And uh, there were a number of financial issues that were raised in our for discussion at the Finance Committee, and we want to carry those over and expand on them through the process. And then the third is to um, uh, work on the work plan for the year um, as requested of all committees. Okay, great. Uh, GOL, 
George? Yeah, there's a detailed uh, report in the packet. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. It's really focused around uh, GOL's uh, annual review of the rules of procedure. Um, we're going to bring forward a couple of proposals with the uh, uh, perhaps fantastic uh, goal of shortening or helping shorten our meetings. Um, they're fairly small proposals. One is to reduce the time. That may not be so small, but um, Rule Procedure 6.3D and, and 6.3E, it's in the packet. Um, we will bring these together uh, as a, a proposal to you fairly soon um, in consultation with the president. Um, we have some future uh, items there as well. So it's basically current recommendations. Uh, we have some future items that um, particularly urge the new members of the committee uh, Sarah and Darcy uh, to look at because, uh, as Mandy said, for her committee, our committee has a, a fairly uh, full plate as well. Um, but we have a number of areas that uh, we again are going to be looking at and again perhaps bringing some recommendations forward. It's in the packet. Um, we also had a whole host of, of questions and uh, concerns raised over the course of the year. Um, and so I, we tried to, uh, we did discuss them. Um, and so they're itemized here. Um, perhaps the one that I can touch on most briefly, um, but there, you can read it for yourself, is uh, emails and text during a meeting. Can't do it, okay? Um, it's against the rules. Um, finally, we're working on a uh, larger uh, issue related to the charter, 8.1, open meeting of the residents. Uh, we've had great help from the uh, town manager and his staff. Um, we hope to have for you soon uh, both the process um, and um, a document that would go with it. There is an issue, you'll find it in the packet, related to the age issue about who, how old you should be. Um, and so the, the committee is gonna to have to wrestle with that at its next meeting um, and come to some determination. Kathy, I know they're calling for the next date for JCPC, so there's no report at this point. Correct? Okay. Uh, TSO, Darcy. Yeah, we do, do not have a report in the packet today. Um, at our last meeting on January 7th, um, there were no appointments um, and we had the first presentation about the D DPW stormwater bylaw proposals, um, which will be reported on when, um, when we get further along with them. Um, and at our meeting this upcoming Thursday, uh, it's it's a meeting of it's a regular meeting plus the whole council is invited because we are going to be looking at uh, the North Common proposal again. Okay, and we'll have responses to questions that councillors have asked. At the, those were forwarded to the um, manager. Um, any liaison reports, Alyssa? It's not a liaison report. It's a question about the GOL report. I'm sorry. Go back to, I didn't see your hand, Alyssa. I'm so sorry. Not Go a back. bit. We were trying to move along. Um, George highlighted so many things there, and there were so many more things yet in the report, but he highlighted the main thing I was concerned about, which was the idea that the charter language could be superseded through a change in the rules of procedure, which I just find to be a jaw-dropping concept. So what does that mean? Because there's a lot of other things we'd change like uh, in the charter, if we could just change them based on rules that actually say like the charter does 18. I don't have any understanding of what that could mean. And if you're trying to explore doing that when that's not a thing, what does that mean? I think that's a fair question, Alyssa, and I'm not sure I can answer it. Um, I don't know if any members of the committee want to speak, but that was my understanding of the discussion at the time that even though the charter language was explicit, there might be some way in which we could get around it. Um, and that's why it's on the agenda for the next meeting, because I have a similar question. Um, okay. But, yeah. I, I can explain further since it was my idea, um, <laughs> which is not to supersede the charter language. It was a, you could have an open meeting of the residents under the charter, which would require all the signatures or the names to be over 18. And at the same time, you could create, just like we've created these work sessions or these things there, you could create a rule under a rule of procedure that mimics 
that 8.1 thing, that 8.1 open meeting of the residents, but applies to whatever age we set. So it would not be a charter open meeting of the residents, but it would mimic all of that thinking and be different. So I hope that clarifies that. <laughs> Gather that it does because all the hands went down. Um, okay, are there any liaison reports? Kathy? Uh, just a very brief one on the Community P Participation Act Committee. They had a very interesting discussion about how to keep the period um, of when they'll receive a proposal open longer and provide information sessions so they can increase participation of residents. So residents would know how to apply for funds. They might get some guidance. Um, and it was all pretty much all of them were saying, we need to do a better job on that um, uh, so that people can know what things might be eligible, how you go about applying, could get some guidance, are you with it on budgeting? And it was a, a solid hour and a half discussion on improving that to, with the goal of increasing participation. Okay, great. Thank you. Any, any other liaison reports? Paul, I think we're up to the town manager's report. Thank you. So just a few things. Um, we're spending a lot, an inordinate amount of time on uh, COVID vaccine and preparing for it, distributing it. You heard, I appreciated that the council gave time to public health director um, Emma Dragon so she could talk a little bit about the work that she's doing. She's doing a really terrific job working very successfully with the fire department. Um, as you're probably sensing in your own communities, there's a lot of anxiety about the, uh, about the vaccine. We're getting inundated with telephone calls through the senior center and through our COVID hotline. Um, you know, literally hundreds of calls coming in people and it's adult children uh, with of, of, of their parents um, who are trying to make sure that they don't miss the boat and we're trying to do as much as we can to help alleviate that we'll be meeting again to talk more about making sure we can help people know when they're going to get it so they don't feel like they're being left behind and that's a big anxiety for a lot of our seniors especially um, a lot of our residents have been returning to town starting today and actually last week for some of the other colleges. Um, and, you know, we have um, a large number who are living on campus, about 5,500 is the estimate, and I think about 6,700, something like that, um, off campus. Um, and so, but the university has a very good protocol, as do, do the other colleges, that you arrive on campus in order to register and to get your keys to your room, actually, you have to go get a test. Um, and then you are quarantined for four days and then you get your second test. And then that, that lets you move forward uh, through the system. Um, and moving forward, I think a lot of you, if you were at the MMA meeting, you saw that uh, Jennifer Moyston was featured as one of our um, uh, people to help recruit a more diverse workforce for municipal sector. Uh, she follows on the heels of Brianna Sunrid, who was featured previously. And so, you know, we've got our rising stars right here in our own town who are out there. The MMA has chosen them to um, be the faces of, of working in cities and towns, which I'm really, really proud of. And they both did a tremendous job, obviously. And lastly, um, I'm starting something new this week, off office hours. So if people who don't want to come to a cup of joe or something, they just want to schedule a time to talk, um, they can set up a time. Um, you know, a designated time on Friday uh, through the town manager's office and we'll have a one-on-one -on -one Zoom conversation sort of, and that's available to folks. Also, um, if, um, and we're doing our community chat on Thursday and on Thursday, we're gonna focus on um, Pomeroy Village so that it gives people the opportunity to ask more questions that if they watch the, sh the, the um, your meeting tonight, they might have additional questions. So Chris Restrup will be joining me and Brianna on Thursday for that. And so I know you have questions, so I'll turn to those. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. Um, just a couple of things. One, I also want to say Brianna did a fantastic job at the MMCA Counselors Association meeting and presentation too. Um, she, she was just fantastic there. Um, thank you so much for the fantastic update of all the Board of License Commissioners have been doing to, to it, it was just, I, I can't say more than it was fantastic to read everything they're doing. Um, question on public works. What's the status of I, I think it's a water treatment facility that we funded. I, I don't I don't remember the name that we had to get back up online before our permit runs out um, was one of the reasons we were borrowing for money. So could you just update us on the status of that if it's been able to be going forward during this COVID time? Um, and then one of the things that struck me in listening to the Community Safety Working Group um, public forums um, where, where they took some testimony was the issue a lot of people had with the UMass Police Department. And so I wanted to bring that up as what can you during these UMass meetings or at other times um, do to speak to UMass about maybe working with our department to address those racial justice issues and all that we're working so hard to address here with the Community Safety Working Group. How do we bring UMass in? Uh, yeah, so um, I'll start with that one first. So we, I have notified UMass, uh, our contacts there, about this, the interest of the Community Safety Working Group and seeking more information and more cooperation from the UMass Police Department. I don't know where that will go, but I, you know, but I think the, you know, as we talked about it at that meeting, they were pretty, the Community Safety Working Group, it's a community safety working group. It's not Amherst police department safety working group and it felt like to me that that was a that was a legitimate thing to explore i mean the challenge for our the working group is that the issue is so gigantic and that but they need we need to focus on what what we can achieve and so it's but they are their the, ex, the experience is so dramatic and so large so their umass is alert to it um i don't know what their response is going to be um in terms of the, it's the Centennial Water Treatment Plant that continues to move forward on design. Um, the uh, unfortunately, the costs continue to be what they are. Uh, it's a, it's a large number, um, but that's moving forward. And um, in terms of getting that plant back online, mm -hmm. Joe, thanks for asking about the UMass Police thing because that was that was very, very prominent in the discussion. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Um, would it be possible to have the per, uh, presentations by uh, the staff members um, be on the town webpage? For, for which presentations? The one you talked about, Jennifer's and um, Brianna's. Hmm, sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Shalini? Yeah. Um, thank you again for the MMA participation. I always find that really helpful. And even though it was Zoom, it was super helpful. And I just wanted to bring one thing up that I heard, and I don't know what is, where is the right forum to bring that up. So I'm just going to say it now. Uh, the keynote speaker was Wes Moore, CEO of Robin Hood Foundation. And uh, the question to him was, um, how do we get, how do we make anti-racism a priority given, you know, there's so many different priorities that a town has and how do you get everyone on board or, and what, and so his answer was that we need, it, it has to start with measurement and, uh, that we need to be able to measure like in our town where the systemic gaps are and, and so I don't know what is the forum to ask for allocation of funding for measurement, because I don't believe we have, and if we do have measurement, maybe we need to highlight and where we need to measure. Um, so where can, how do we go about having that discussion, but budgeting for measurement of systemic gaps? I don't know the answer to that. I know there are groups, you know, the reparations group is looking at the, at different measures. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the League of Women Voters have looked at some certain things as well. I think it's something that uh, I don't have a good answer for you. I don't for that. 
where to go from here on that, honestly. Yeah, I don't need the answer now, but um, but Lynn, can you suggest, like, is that something that, where do we discuss, or is it something, Paul, that you will think about and get back to us, or is it something we're supposed to discuss? Let me talk about that with Paul and see whether or not there's um, resources and whether the existing um, community safety working group has any of that kind of flowing from their recommendations as well. Okay. Right. Or even if we can support the reparations for Amherst group, like if they're doing the work and have res so it's like we should be supporting them or someone should be doing it basically, but not redundancy. Like if community working group is already doing it, then let's make sure we support them. Or if the reparations group is doing, then let's support them. But let's just be clear who's doing it, but someone should be doing it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Alyssa? I was just going to mention that um, Brianna's slides from the uh, Counselors Association meeting are already in tonight's packet, thanks to Lynn and Athena. And then the other thing that, and so we should put up a link to the video too for um, both of them. But the other part is that in regards to the UMass, I think that's a multi-layered thing with the UMass police. I think because of the relationships you have over the COVID discussion, the reopening discussion, that that will help figure out those conversations. But I think it's not just a conversation. I really appreciate you bringing it up, Minnie Jo. It's not just a conversation between the two police departments because many moons ago, I went to both their citizens academies and there, shall we say, ebbs and flows as to how much they're willing to even talk to each other. And so there, it, there's this very siloed approach, typically, except when a big event is happening. And so finding a way to talk about that, not only with it, the chiefs are one thing, right? But it's the actual people doing the work that are another conversation altogether. And so finding a way to work at it from both like the community relations, external relations standpoint, as well as the peer to peer police standpoint, I think that I think there's just a bunch of different ways it needs to be approached if you get pushed back in one area and then for another. Because the thing is, if if people are having bad experiences on the Amherst College campus, the reality is the Amherst College campus is a private school. The UMass campus is a state school that's this giant property that lots of people have interactions with. And so it's entirely appropriate that they're considered part of our community, even more so than in Amherst and New Hampshire. And so finding, you know, whichever levers we might need to pull in terms of those relationships, I'm saying it's not just one thing, it's perhaps a bunch of different ways of approaching UMass to say, we need to be able to have some conversations. Thank you. Any other comments for town manager's report? We're this to the town council comments to receive my first president's report. I've asked for questions. I've gotten a couple, particularly about the scheduling for the uh, library, and I'll come back with a more full answer on that. Um, Darcy, you have a question or comment. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that um, the ECAC annual report was in the packet. Um, and I think Lynn has plans to do something about that at the next meeting is what what is I was I really wanted to know we put it in at the last minute. So first of all, you really haven't had a chance to look at it. This is the report that's just required from them annually. And I wanted to ask whether the council would like uh, the chair of ECAC to come to the meeting, a, a future meeting. Or do you want to wait until they're ready to come forward with their recommendations? Which I believe is in April, isn't it Darcy? Uh, it, yeah, it's supposed to be in April, um, but yeah, I personally think that it makes sense to have a very brief update. Um, this is the annual report, and the um, and there's a funding funding request in the in the document. Right. 
This is the schedule of brief update on February 8th and include the report again. Okay. Uh, anything else, Darcy? Okay, Mandy Jo. Yeah, thank you for the written report, Lynn. I really appreciated it. Um, just a couple of comments and questions. Uh, library engagement. I'd love us to consider a weekend. I think the community safety working group that held one on the weekend showed that weekends can attract people. Um, and so we probably shouldn't avoid that. Um, the meetings with Senator Comerford, since they're not regular, could I request a note that maybe a week or so or a few days ahead of that meeting, those meetings that you just sort of ping us so that if there's something out that um, we can get it to you at that time because we don't really think ahead to a nebulous there might be a meeting next month um and with that um just you know some curiosities i had one was what open meeting law changes are being considered for permanent adoption at the state level that might affect what gol is looking at in terms of their own covid moving out of covid and what changes we can keep and not um, and then it sounded like from your report that the RCV special legislation has not actually been filed yet. Um, my understanding was it could be filed at any time. So I'm concerned that they are choosing not to file it. Um, I know there's no committees formed, but I would urge you and the Senator Comerford, I don't know whether it has to go through her office or Rep Dom's office, but um, whoever files it, I would urge to file it now, not wait another month. Um, I thought it would get filed in early January. That came up at the very end and literally Paul was running one way, Joe was running the other, and I didn't get to push that. And I'm going, what? <laughs> so thank you. I will follow up on that even well before next month. Okay. Yeah. And, and then the final thing, the big conversation about the spring farmer's market, uh, uh, I guess spring farmer's market, I was unsure of the term. I assume this is the farmer's market that starts in the spring, but runs through November. Um, what's being discussed? Um, I, I guess my concern is it's a council decision if the plan is for a public way or on the common. Um, and so maybe that should be at a committee level instead of just at the town manager president level. Yep, agree. And let me just say that got raised in the bid meeting. And I can say that both Paul and David said, well, oh, yeah, I think we better get on that. <laughs> so yes, a recommendation. And then that does have to come because it is a request for use of the public way. It has to go to TSO at a minimum. Okay. Anything else, Mandy Jo? Nope, that's it. Okay, great. Any other questions? Yes, Shalini. I just wanted to thank you, like if it's not like you're doing enough already, now you're creating this long report for us. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And it does bring more transparency and also is pretty scary. I don't think anyone wants to be a president after looking at that report. <laughs> it's a good way to hold on to that <laughs> because that, yeah, that's a lot of work and I really appreciate you. Thank you. I'm continuing to look for opportunities where you know, another counselor might go with me to some meeting or that kind of thing. I, I just needed to kind of get a grasp on what does it really looks, look like. I This is the first time I've ever put, it's not even a month, it's only three weeks on paper. And I'm going, oh my God. Okay, thank you. That was enough. Uh, Shalini, anything else? Okay, let me also mention that on the 8th, we have now invited UMass to come at 5.30. And, you know, this is optional. Uh, I mean, it, it will call it a council meeting, but it's really the purpose is one of these information meetings about their spring and how it's going and so forth. But we're also going to use it as an opportunity for updates on vaccination plans and so forth, uh, expanding a little bit, and maybe we'll have even more information uh, but that will be on the 8th and at 5.30. And just to add, uh, Paul mentioned the, um, we've been pushing them for these numbers and we got them to get today. Uh, they do feel that there's like about 7,050 7, UMass students who are living in the area. And of that, about 650 are living in Amherst. And then they also mentioned 
that there are about 6,000 unique students, I thought this was quite interesting, who are doing face-to-face -face classes. And of that, about only 3,100 live on campus. So there's a lot of students who live in the area who are going to campus for classes. And those are the kinds of numbers and information we're asking them to provide. They'll have much, much more solid numbers on the 8th because they begin classes on Monday. I'm looking at Evan, I'm looking at uh, Steve, both of whom have classes beginning. And um, they will also provide us more information about, oh, that, that's the other thing. They are committed to ongoing testing of asymptomatic for residents. They won't do it this week, this coming week, <coughs> no, because of the students returning, but they will resume it the following week. And I think they're gonna be doing as many as three days a week for asymptomatic testing of residents who are not affiliated with the university at all. Okay, and then, um, are there any other counselor comments? And I want to make note that, um, yeah, that was it. Any other council comments? Yes. Um, just a quick one, Lynn, on what you just said about 5.30 um, and UMass. Could you provide, I wrote it down quickly, but could you re provide a sentence by email? Because I'll get the Neighborhood Association to put it in their little updates because there's a lot of interest in North Amherst on the students returning on updates on what's going on and then we could maybe not have to have a separate district one meeting on it but you know but just so if you give me a sentence I literally will just send it over so they can say um you right. might turn on okay um, Dorothy very quick question in my date book, I had written in on February 8th, out underneath town council, the word vote, but I don't know what it is that we are voting on. I just, could, so could you refresh my memory? Imagine we're going to vote on a number of things. Um, so I don't know what that one particularly would refer to. I do know that we have two, um, we have two resolutions coming forward that are being reviewed by GOL this week. Anybody have any other recollection? I, I'll, as we put together the count, the agenda will be, maybe it'll, maybe it'll dawn on you, okay? Is there any other comment or question at this time? Then I am going to call the meeting adjourned and it is 11.10.